Let's get this all over again. Who knows? Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Well, Cause I mean, we're, it's 11. Are you ready to rock, Eric? I am. Have you pressed the button? Hi, Eric. Eric has pressed the button. So we should be live, everybody. I know it always takes a nanosecond to decide whether we're live, but we probably are. Mr. Brad, how are you, Brad Wood? Are you doing well? I'm good. I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm good. My computer's talking in the background, so I have to turn that volume down. It's fantastic. We're, we're actually probably only about a mile and a half away from each other. I know. But we're Stay doing... that way. Stay that way. Stay that way. <laughs> Stay back. My, uh, <laughs> my mic stand's drooping. Is that some kind of metaphor? I don't know what that is. But anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> As we get older, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> the mic stands. <laughs> Things start to droop. So how how is everything? You good? Uh, all things considered, things are really well here. Thank you. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. I mean, you and I both have studios in our vicinity, shall we say. So basic, yeah. basically, quite a lot of my life has barely changed. I literally get up in the morning and go into the studio and work. And then I go back and go to sleep. And that's 90% of my life anyway. I'm sure it's pretty much, has it been the same for you? Uh, yeah, it's been exactly the same as that. And I, I posted on my Instagram a couple of days ago um, a screen grab from a text conversation that I had with somebody that basically said, I've been social distancing since 2004 yep. when I built the studio in the backyard. It, it really, my, my schedule has not changed. My routine, I should say, hasn't changed. Uh, my, you know, my wife and my younger daughter and my older daughter, who does, but they don't live, she doesn't live here anymore. Uh, but essentially, all, all I notice is as far as the difference is that I walk into the house every now and again to check the mail, get a cup of tea or something like that, and there's there's people in there. You know, right. it's usually just it's usually just me and the dog, and and then of course if I have clients, um, uh, that's the, maybe the only difference. Sure, um, is that I don't have anybody in the studio with me. You know, and I think that's smart. We have to do our bit. Yeah, my the first week uh, the, it affected us. I we did actually uh, we had a client coming in that week to finish up an album. So mm -hmm. that it was a little bit of a shame that we couldn't do that, but it is what it is. Hey, there's tons of questions here. Let's uh, go. Yeah, and I want and so hi everybody. Hope you're all doing marvelously well. Please ask Brad questions. I'm going to try and scroll back because I know there were so many of you were waiting beforehand. Um, oh no, so, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, Dan Sterling says hi, Brad. Absolutely love capital letters. Your work with me without you. Mm. How do you go about planning an album like Brother Sister, where all the songs blend together across the album? That's a big question. Ooh, that's a big question, and it's a really simple answer. Hi, Dan. Thanks for the question. Um, Me Without You, Brother Sister was the second album that, that we recorded together. And uh, when they came here for pre-production, which is basically setting up in the studio, uh, and uh, and start to rehearse the songs with me sitting amongst them, they had already written most of the songs and I had challenged them to try to track the album in order. So the first song that we recorded would be the first song on the record. The last song that we recorded would be the last song on the record. And then we nice. rehearsed it. We rehearsed it that way for, I don't know, 10 days. And, um, and we worked on the arrangements and that's exactly how, why it, it sounds seamless. And there were moments where a song would be ending. Uh, I can't remember the name of the song where they're hitting some hard, crashes and then it's and then the last crash goes up a step and that goes into the next song the key of the next song and as those kinds of moments that we were able to um program into the recording so the reason that album flows that way is because we rehearsed it and they recorded it that way well dan is a pretty smart cookie that he he, he figured that out that that it must Good have question. been deliberate yeah really yeah. nice Evan uh, Cordier says, when it comes to building a mix and monitoring the master bus, how loud do you have the drums? Um, going in, if first going to the master bus in order to avoid clipping to bring in the other instruments. And he's clarifying. In other words, are the drums touching the compressor limiter on the master? Or is the comp lister only really working with the full band unmuted? Oh, I, I understand that question. Oh, yeah. I think I understand it as well. Um, I Back in 1996, I bought a smart CL2 stereo compressor limiter which is an ssl style uh compressor and um and i've pretty much parked it on my stereo mixes ever since and uh i've evolved uh, a way of setting you know settings that i don't change two to one and maybe auto release or auto you know whatever 
and I watch it. And as I feed, uh, as my mix evolves, I watch those faders. And if they start to move more than just a tiny bit, maybe a, a single or a, a two dB of, of, of gain reduction, um, that's, I'm always monitoring the gain reduction. Then I know to back it off. Um, it's just sort of a, a self check and it provides glue and all the other things that, you know, that we like about, about master bus compression, but I don't hit it hard. And if I do, then I know to back off. Um, uh, so that's pretty much it. I'm really conservative when it comes to compression overall on my stereo mix. Do you find, do you find the transients of the drums are the main thing that's triggering it though? The kick and snare transients? No, I no. When, when you know to so well, you know, I could take a look right now. Actually, yeah. <laughs> just, okay, so yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna. I can't show you the 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 C2 compressor. I'm pointing at something that you guys can't see, but I could just turn on the drums for a song that a session I brought up. Great. And if you could see. If you could see what the compressor's doing, it's barely moving. So let me put the other elements in and we'll see how much my master bus compressor is moving. Yeah. Okay, I can report back to you now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's um, just good. Uh, you know, maybe a half dB of, of gain reduction and then when the entire mix is going, that's during the verse, so it'll be louder in the chorus. It seems to be about a dB, but uh, it does seem to be really dependent on the kick drum and the snare drum. Um, but you know, once you get the low end, the bass guitar and other, you know, heavier guitars and stuff like that in there, then it, it seems to push it another half dB to a dB. Yeah, does I, that make any sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. <clears throat> my own, my own experience um, has been that that was one of my biggest challenges for many many years was trying to figure out how to tame the kick and snare transients so that my mm. mixes didn't look like fishtails when I went to mastering. You know, it wasn't, mm. all, it wasn't all just kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare with this blob of right. information in the middle. And that, that, that took a while to really, you know, get, get done really well. Well, and, and let me ask you, uh, I know we have other questions, but I want to follow up. Like, how, how did you figure that out? Um, I th <laughs> How did you overcome that so it doesn't look like fishtails? Uh, well, I, I, I think, depending on the genre. Um, this, is, this is water. This is water, water, not vodka. <laughs> the vo the vodka is on the other side. Um, so <laughs> yeah. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, you're, go ahead. You're pixelated, but we can hear you. So, you know, maybe do you have a pixelate button that you hit? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, no, the, um, well, I think it depends on the genre. I actually realized I, I, I wasn't afraid to actually um, take my drum bus and be a little bit more aggressive with the transients, meaning, you know, I might stick a mm. limiter on there just to shave off some of the top of the kick and snare transient, but it's all song dependent. If I'm working with something um, really open and beautiful, then there's nothing like that going on. And then if I'm working mm. on something in the middle, so maybe it's a piano driven pop song, so it's no, mm. there's no heavy guitars in it and sometimes you know a little bit of limiting just to catch the peaks the great thing about digital as we all know is you can do look ahead so easily you know something right. that was so difficult in our analog days where it you would be so difficult to figure out how to do things like that because there wasn't really that many options with look ahead compressors and things um you know i remember trying to do digital delay line stuff and creating a sub bus and putting that through a stereo. Uh, I remember that too. Oh God! This yeah, yeah. Look ahead. Look ahead was really that was such an exciting concept back in the day. You yeah. Know, like, oh my God! It can actually like technically almost sort of look ahead. And um, uh, I mean, I do put compression on my kick, my individual kick drum sounds. I do uh, before my before my stereo drums come out and go into uh, this console behind me, they they almost always go through at least one other stereo compressor limiter, usually two, and they're set uh, to chain into each other and they do different things. Um, w one is uh, MCUC, I forget, uh, uh, Klangheim makes that? No, not Klangheim. Yeah, yeah, no, or, Klanghelm, Klanghelm, yeah. No. Right. And, we love uh, them, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and that's got a sort of a gluier, slower attack and seems to tighten up uh, sort of the trailing low end on a kick drum. And then I've got that going into uh, Waves uh, SSL compressor. Again, very light, 
and then that all goes into the console. So, and also individual compression on the snare drums and always an 11 and 76 kind of compressor on the snare drum because I love the transit response and letting some of that peek through and then squelching, you know, uh, afterwards. So, uh, lots and lots of compression, none of it doing a ton of work unless I'm going for a really, you know, dramatic sound, usually with a room mic or something. So it's, it, you're employing, and I totally relate to this, a lot of serial compression, but like oh, little, little things. And as, yeah, you're, as you're yeah. pointing out, each compressor sort of does a little bit of a different job. It's That's not, right. It's less, or it's not only about game reduction, it's about sound shaping. Mm -hmm. So this talking of um, going into the console, we have a question from Chaz here at Electric Outworks. And Chaz says, I'm curious how important summing through the Neve centerpiece is, f is for Brad's mixes. And has he tried any dim digital uh, transformer emulations like the Kazrog True Iron, for instance? Because I know that you're into the. Um, I remember when we interviewed you over there. You were, <coughs> excuse me. You were talking about the different. What, what is it like? The red and the blue settings for silk. Different, yeah. Yeah, silk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I run red silk on the output of uh, of the centerpiece, the Rupert Neve fifty sixty. Um, that's a good question, Chaz. I. I, uh, I've always mixed, um, in the digital world, uh, with some sort of hybrid and back in 98 to 2003, I was syncing with a micro uh, my pro tools to one or more 224 tracks. And sometimes we'd just do a one-to-one -one transfer and then mix all analog. And then that slowly evolved to more and more things coming off of pro tools. And then eventually in 2000, 2003 was the last time I mixed with any analog at all. And then I went to a, um, a stem output and that's, you know, stereo drums, stereo guitars and bass and stereo vocals. Um, and I've gone through a, a variety of different, uh, summing, uh, analog summing. I just like having the tactile ability to, you know, turn things up and down really quickly. I, I find with this console in particular, it's great for tracking. Um, if a vocalist needs to hear, more vocal. I could. I just grab the faders and bring them down. I don't have to reach out. It's. It's. Uh, so that that tactile aspect works, but um, I just think my mixes come together more quickly, especially with the fifty sixty. I, I. I'm sure because our brains are huge supercomputers and really able to uh, to do all kinds of, you know, fast computations. I could learn to mix with headphones on a laptop. You know, and if coronavirus keeps going, maybe that's where we'll all end up. I'll be just living in my car doing mixes out of my laptop. But, uh, but this is the way that that I, I find most comfortable for me, and my mixes come together quickly. I have not used those emulations that you you suggested. Um, those uh, the iron thing. I've, I've heard about them, but not used them. Um, great answer. Hit the road. Music says, um, "What is the best advice you ever got for mixing?" And also, what is the best advice you ever got for producing and he specifically says you know something that you feel like really changed your ways of doing things like was there anything that you, you learned could it be well for for yeah. mixing for sure yeah mix mix quietly the the preponderance of your time mixing should be spent mixing quietly at least that's the way i've learned um I used to just listen to everything loud because I get excited about it. and then most of the records i've recorded have been rock and roll and and rock and roll really kind of sounds best really effing loud. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, when I was making tar albums back in the late eighties, early nineties, uh, there was a lot of volume, you know, a lot of volume all the time. And there's a lot of dudes in the room and you sort of have to overcome the chatter and, and, uh, and, uh, I had to learn and, and took some advice. I forget who gave it to me, but just turn that down and um and mix as quietly as you can stand and then sort of you know live with it for a while it's gotten a lot easier now that i mix almost completely remotely without any clients um exactly but that took me a, took yeah. me a long time to 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 learn when to deploy volume <clears throat> not that volume isn't important and isn't crucial you have to turn it up and also it's nice to just feel it you know i mean rock and roll is a visceral thing for me first and foremost so um but I do, uh, I do think that mixing quietly helps a lot. If you can get those balances to work quiet, uh, at quiet volume, then, then you know, you've got, if you, you know, if your bass guitar disappears when you're listening really quietly or on your laptop speaker, then you know, you've got a problem. You need to readdress that. And, and that will be 
everyone's homework kind of like permanently. How do you get those elements that really kind of need volume to speak? And that's tricks of EQ and that's tricks, not tricks, those techniques of EQ and compression. Um, and, and obviously level where you put it in the mix, you know, and, and in its relationship to the other instruments, it's, it's tricky. Uh, and, and I found that when I played everything really loud all the time, um, I was missing those things and then things wouldn't translate to a car stereo. Things wouldn't translate to a boom box and to headphones, uh, mixing quietly seems to make me focus on, on really the job of mixing <laughs> your balances. Yeah. You know? I think that's really amazing points you're bringing up there. I was thinking about this the other day between where we are with mixing in stereo and where, you know, things, not that everybody's moving to this, but this sort of Atmos idea, these multi-speaker ideas. Mm. And I've, I've sat in a few rooms and heard some incredible mixes through these multi-speakers. And I realized that you can't mix Atmos like you would mix stereo because when we're in stereo, we're going, we're trying to get that feeling of walking into a rehearsal room where the band's mm -hmm. playing and it's ear splittingly loud and aggressive and exciting. But you and I know if we put a stereo pair of microphones up in that room and then recorded it and brought it back, it'd actually be completely underwhelming. It would just be, <laughs> boom, da, ba -doom, doom, da -ba -doom, da -ba -doom. it wouldn't yeah. be the big, yeah. loud, obnoxious ear bleeding sound of being in a sweaty, small rehearsal room where everything is too loud. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, like you were saying a couple of minutes ago, that's why we employ EQ to exaggerate high mids so they're a little bit more biting. Compression maybe for parallels so everything's sort of spilling out. But that isn't actually what is going on. That's mm. us creating tricks to add the excitement that you would feel if you're in the room. Mm -hmm. I think with Atmos, it's going to be interesting because that doesn't work. You can't have all the speakers competing against each other at the same time. So it's, it, it is, I think the, what I'm trying to say is like we mix for the medium, whatever it might be, you know, whatever the mm -hmm. medium is, we have to think that way. And what about the second part of his question? Was there anything in production that you maybe just learned from somebody and were like, Oh, most of my production, uh, techniques I've learned, uh, I've learned myself. Um, I didn't really intern with anyone, uh, for any length of time. Um, it was mostly Brian Deck and myself discussing how to produce. And, and I gotta be honest, uh, most of what I've learned, um, came from the benefit of having a really great saxophone teacher, two of them. One was Ken Stein when I was a kid and the other one was Steve Duke in college. And the techniques that, that they taught me about, really ele elemental stuff like tempo. Uh, I practiced to a click track from the time, a click track, a, a metronome, a Franz metronome from the time I was, you know, 10 years old until, until I got out of college. I mean, that's just how you practice. You practice to a metronome and my sense of time was shaped by that. That's how classical players learn how to play. That's not how most jazz players learn how to play. I don't know about now, but we're talking about back in, you know, the olden days when I was a kid. And when I started working with bands uh, as a re record producer and there were tempo issues. I would say, well, we need to play to a click. And I had a drum machine. This is back before digital. And um, I would use a side stick sound and feed it to the drummers. And a lot of the drummers were really surprised by that. Um, they thought that it was weird and not punk rock and not musical. And, and I would have to then sell them on the concept that I had early on, everyone I knew in the jazz and classical world, especially in college, they all had their own metronomes. They carried them in their bags. They took them to the practice spaces. Everyone practiced to a click. Uh, and everybody in every jazz combo, jazz ensemble, wind ensemble, orchestra, they all had conductors. And those people were setting the tempo. Tempo, tempo, tempo is really important. Not that you have to play to a click when you're recording, just knowing what you're doing in relation to it and rehearsal. So uh, that's an example of the things that I pulled out of my mm -hmm. life as a trained musician to be a, a, a decent record producer. And then arrangement, just getting a good, having a good grasp of what makes a song work in whatever genre you're working with. So if it's hip hop genre, or if it's, you know, country, or if it's, you know, indie rock, you know, say like Me Without You, there are there are things that that all of those genres have that are specific to to being a su successful and um, or or not, um, and being familiar with that and and uh, 
So I really, I don't think I have ever got any record production advice, to be honest. None, none that I can conjure. I just sort of created my own. And the other thing is I tried to stay in pre-production when I'm first helping come up with the arrangements. I try to stay as, um, I try to get as bored as quickly as possible. So if, you know, I sit there and I just listen and there's no singing going on and there's just sort of like drumming and, and guitar playing happening and there's no hooks happening. There's just a sort of dead space. Well, then I'll write down, I'll make a mental note or I'll write down something needs to happen here. The idea that you should be handing off like, like, like batons in a, in a relay race, the, in, you know, something needs to be interesting happening all the time. I try to pretend that I've got ADHD and I just can't be bothered to pay attention for more than five seconds at a time. And if something interesting is not happening, then something needs to happen there. That's a systemic problem. You know, th th these are things that I've sort of just learned and I employ them. So that's, I, unfortunately, no one really uh, gave me production advice. Not, not, in, not in the time that I could actually have been useful to me when I was young. Right. I was, fl I was making it up as I went. <laughs> I, it's interesting, you know, when, when, um, somebody who doesn't work in the mu music industry said, what is a producer? I mean, I, there is no answer. What I always say is a producer, and this is an easier comparison for people. I always go think of a director. What's a director? You know, a director can be, um, Tim Burton, meaning, they have it's a visual masterpiece they yeah. they know exactly but then i read an interview with tim burton maybe 15 20 years ago and he said i wouldn't know a good script if it hit me in the head <laughs> so he's not about he doesn't direct the actors that much apparently but he mm. creates the atmosphere and the and the illusions and and this this sense of just beauty that people sort of like involved in this thing you know sure. wrapped in it or whatever the word is and um so that's one style and then there's other people the great directors like uh, ron howard who was an actor so he learned to be an actor so he when when you watch him talk about it all he does is not all he does all's the wrong word what he does is he gets performances out of actors mm -hmm. so then there's set designers and art directors worrying about the other stuff so my point is, is it's very easy to to use to, uh, visual medium to describe audio in this respect because that's a that's a producer. I mean, some right. some producers are in there like ripping apart, ripping the songs apart, and then others, um, you know, are cheerleaders and and creating great atmospheres. And I think the only thing that I hope you you and I probably are picking up after doing this is trying to be a bit of all of those things and bring them all together sure. and know when to read the room. One thing I, I want mean, to quick quickly go back sure, to. Go ahead is you made a good point. Now when you're mixing remotely, you don't have to mix loud. We didn't talk about that. When I've got a couch here, and if there's a band in the room and I'm trying to mix, mm -hmm. I mix for shorter periods of time and I always end up mixing too loud because there's no way I can get four guys and girls to stop talking. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> It, but that's true. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Be honest. You picked. You said it, and I, 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 meant I should have pointed it out then. But that's the truth. Mixing remotely means what I'm trying to say to everybody is you can control your environment. You don't have to mix loud all the time anymore because you're not having four people sitting around ordering pizza and drinking Budweiser. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm going to go on some more questions. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a good one. Uh, uh, Alexi says. Do you still use any reference tracks while you're mixing? Oh my gosh! Yeah, all the time. I oh, you refer do? Good. constantly. Who? Who? Tell us. As very specific to the song. Um, so if, oh man, uh, yes, uh, constantly. I mean, it really depends. So uh, uh, the Liz Fair record that I just finished. We're uh, we're old friends. Twenty nine years in here, we've made. I've recorded 70 some songs of hers at this point. I think we added it up. Uh, we've worked together for decades on again, off again. And we, we were referring back to her first record <laughs> as right. if it was like, you know, yep. I mean, we, to, yep. to, to, to listen to guitar sounds. Um, uh, but also like throughout that process, there would be a song that, um, that she really liked, um, that would be like, uh, well, uh, Lil Nas X's, you know, like, uh, Old Town Road. We listen. We refer to that all the time. I was listening specifically to 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 the arrangement. She was trying to gain some some vocal uh, ideas behind it. Um, but in general, are you still there? Are we? Uh, yeah, uh, I was just distorting okay. a bit, and I, I uh, oh, the, the mic pre's on. I am. Is it on my side? No, on oh. my side. So I was just asking Eric which one of the mic pre's I am. But but, but when it comes to rock and roll, I gotta say. 
I got to give it up to Chris Lord Algae, <laughs> American idiot. I mean, that is to me still the gold standard for modern rock that translates to every format that's been, that's come before it or after it. Um, the way that he was able to get the kick and snare and the toms to speak and the guitars are always loud and, and, uh, Armstrong's vocal, man, I mean, there's a lack of super high end on the vocals, but they still cut through. I use that. I mean, that's been out, what, about 20 years this year or 18 years, 17 years. It's still to me sort of like the, the gold standard. I, I, I oftentimes use that, um, when I'm working on, on heavier guitar stuff, just, you know, just sort of clear my palate, see where we're at, especially at the end of tracking. If it's a record I've been you know, producing from, from the start. Um, but it is interesting because for me, I, it's, I, it's Bob Clear Mountain. I go back to Woman in Change, oh, sure. which is even older. But but it's interesting because of what we're both saying here is the same thing. Is like it's not always like whatever's latest and greatest. No, not at all. Um, with Liz and with a lot of other singer songwriters I work with, I use Bob Dylan as a as a reference all the time, uh, all the time. Uh, some some, Dil some of Dil Dylan's recordings are some of the best recordings ever made, as far as I'm concerned. The sound of his acoustic guitar and his voice and the way. Um, uh, like like a Rolling Stone. I mean, the the balances on that are just genius, and they you know they cut that with really great players. I think here in, in L.A. or was that New York? It doesn't really matter, but it's really really well recorded. And again, it's defied you know every format that's come out. It's been out for over fifty years, and it still comes on, and people sing along with it, and it still rocks. And there's you know no real drums on it, you know, but there's some really loud ass tambourine. Um, Rolling Stones, man, how many times did Liz and I refer to Street Fighting Man on this new record? I mean, my God, uh, the sound of the distorted acoustic guitar and again, the vocal balance and where the reverbs are on the drums. Um, I, I refer all the time. I refer back to the clash. I refer back to the who constantly, um, man, um, Never mind the Bullocks. Here's the sex pistols. That's a really great record to listen to for references, mm. man. You know, I mean, but I, I, I listen to kind of everything electronic. Um, I listen to a lot of can. I, I refer to can a lot and craft work a lot because of the way things sound. Um, I think that an artist like LCD Sound System, I use him as a reference all the time. I'm always biting his stuff. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, but I, I'm a big uh, I, I, I refer big constantly. Kraut, I'm a big, as they call it, you know, the, the, the British term when I grew up was kraut rock. Kraut rock. I, yeah, yeah, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, can. Yep. I was just talking about Mother Up Duff the other day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I grew up on a lot of that stuff. And also, be, you know, uh, my age group, you know, we, all of us sort of Joy Division, New Order, Cure, you know, growing up with that in England in the 80s, late 70s, oh, yeah. early 80s. Being a kid yeah. through that period. Um, then, uh, then, gang, gang, gang of Four. I mean, oh. I mean, come on. Andy Gill's production. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I, he just, I don't know if you, you probably know, he died just a couple of oh, months yeah. ago. Yeah. I know. I yeah. know. It's yeah, Andy Gill's production, um, his guitar playing. It's it was just such a creative time. I just did a video about this a couple of weeks ago when because somebody asked me, um, what is your um, what do you use for reference tracks? And I was like, definitely there's um, mixing reference, but when it comes to production, I don't listen to anything production wise. And you're saying exactly the same thing based on frequency response. I'm not like going, oh, I need to listen to a production because I want to get the low lows and the high highs. No, I'm listening for production for inspiration. Yep. You know, I, that's yeah, for why, sure. That's why, you know, going back to the German uh, late 60s, early 70s German bands, the first bands to really, quite frankly, employ synthesizers in an interesting way. And the arrangements mm -hmm. of bands like, is that, I think it's Neu, isn't it? Because it's Neumann, Neu, you know, with the exclamation mark. Yeah. Yep. Neu, you know, you listen to that stuff and you hear where Joy Division got a lot of their ideas. And yeah. it's, it's challenging. I mean, but then also being uh, British, we loved the Velvet Underground. We loved, yep. you know. Again, same thing, you know, that great um, John Peel quote about the Velvet Underground. Not many people bought the Velvet Underground records, but those that did started bands. <laughs> yep. Um, okay. Let me just, there's tons of great questions here. Um, mm -hmm. People, are, there's a lot of questions about the, uh, the reference tracks, but I think, I think you're answering it by saying that you pick it based on genre. And I, and I refer all the time. I, the only time I don't is when uh, the client or artist I'm working with is uncomfortable with that. So notably, uh, Billy Corgan, when we were working on the Adore record, when we first started, I would 
I would reference. I'd say, oh, that really sounds like something that Elliot Easton from the Cars would have done. Mm. And Billy would then go, okay, well, we're not going. I'm not going to be playing that <laughs> because I don't want it. I don't want to have any any even subconscious references. And um, and then eventually he just said, hey man, like stop referencing. It really it really messes with my head. And I had to like, it's not how I work. So I, I just had to hold my tongue, and I and I did. But but I have no problem with that. I mean, I mean what's the quote? Um, was it uh, Stravinsky or some, you know who was it that said yeah. uh, all artists uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal? Yeah, 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 <laughs> right. yeah. Uh, you just don't know that they've done that. But I, I think the idea that we could ever exist in a bubble and not be influenced is uh, is ridiculous. And frankly, none of the uh, records I'm talking about are the you know these really fine productions from you know from the old days. Um, I don't. I don't think I could ever. I mean, we can try to to mimic it. You're not ever really going to get there. You're, what you're going to come up with is something on your own that'll be unique. But uh, I reference all the time throughout the process, constantly. It's. It, I can't stop it. It's. It's just how I'm wired, and I don't have any problem with it. But I will hold back on it if, if it's too much for who I'm working with. Yeah, you're right. It's interesting. I I like those moments. I enjoy those moments when you can stop or there's a, a, a there's a convenient moment, a break, and you can just pull up something and just be like, "Listen to this." For me, um for me one of the one one of the things I absolutely love for vocals is like Ashes to Ashes because oh, because yeah. he, he's got I think I can't I can't think we counted it once. 5 it might be six. It's at least five completely different vocal styles on one song. He's like, do yeah. you remember? And then he's like, oh, yeah. no, don't say it's not true. And then he goes, it's just a message from the action man. I'm yep. happy. He goes through all these voices. Huh? And and the low octave. Low I'm octave. I'm happy. Oh, you happy to and then the speak like, like, And then the spoken oh, stuff going on in the speakers, left to right, outside of it. I, I never knew. I never knew. I never oh, knew that. So but he's a, he, yeah, genius. So I use that all the time because <laughs> if I'm working with a singer, um, I don't I don't like to tell singers they're doing anything wrong. I like to. This is quite specific. I like to find the stuff that I love and bring it out. If they just did a whole verse and two lines were abs or two words of one line were amazing, that's what I talk yeah. about. I don't right. go your verse sucked. I go, hey, check out this this area here. Wow, listen to the tonality. How did you do that? That's so special. Right. But then what I'll do is I'll, I'll play things like Ashes to Ashes because it, if it's pertinent for exactly the reasons you're talking about, because I can be like, hey, you know, listen to what you did here. Listen to what he's done. Look how much you could do more. And mm -hmm. it, so, yeah, I, I, I hear you. Plus, didn't we all get into music because we love it? And so... People, the artists that work with us, feed off our passion and our love for music. So Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I need to. Sometimes you need to demonstrate that as a record producer or as an engineer. Well, no, <laughs> if you're hired as an assistant or an engineer, your job is to keep quiet unless asked. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, if you're running the show um, and people are there entrusting their their artwork with you know to you, uh, I think that it's uh, it's it's kind of a smart thing to show that you do have some enthusiasm because they're, you know, I've learned that especially with you, people who are quite a bit younger than I am. And now that I'm 56, everyone's quite a bit younger than me. So, uh, you know, uh, when these, these folks come in, they kind of want to see, they want to see the old man still ha has some fire in his belly, you know, and, and there's plenty. Um, and sometimes it's good to demonstrate it. Um, and I also find that, that playing back some of these classic songs, is uh, for me personally uh, a shocking reminder of just what you can get away with and still have a song that will be remembered years later. That not everything has to be perfectly compressed or perfectly EQ'd or panned up the center. You know, you can have drums that are meandering or even go away, get you know so quiet you can't hear the snare drum, but it's uh, it still sounds great. So you know, put on the car song where they get out of the first chorus, uh, best friend's girlfriend, or I forget which it's off the first album. And, and the drummer completely misses the snare drum. He just shanks it and he misses the snare completely. It just goes away for a beat. And I heard it as a kid and I've never been able to unhear it, but you know, millions and millions and millions of people, it doesn't seem to bother them. So, you know, as a reminder to myself that you can be more adventurous with sounds and mixing techniques and go for more of the excitement because really all the stuff we're talking about are, yeah. are memorable performances. So, yeah, I, I, I've 
said this a thousand times and probably you've heard me say it even in our conversations, but, uh, you know, search and destroy when the guitar solo comes in. The first time I ever heard it, I cranked it because I'm listening and then the guitar solo comes in about <laughs> probably nine, not exaggerating, nine dB too loud. I remember <laughs> taking my headphones off and throwing them across the room because yep. it was so loud and then getting really excited and putting them back on again. I mean, it was a yeah. great experience. <laughs> Like whoa! What is that? Yep. It's 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 all wrong in air yep. quotes. You know, like yep. that was that was mixed incorrectly. Yeah. Right. Um. So uh, there's more questions. Yeah. There's, so there's a lot of like little bits and pieces questions. I'm going to try and pull a lot of them together. Um. Somebody did mm. ask about whether you use summing. Yes, you do. You probably yes. came in a little late. Um. What's the model of the Neve again called that you use? The fifty sixty centerpiece. Great. And that's just sit behind you. There it is. Hey. Um. There it is. Are you friends with Jonathan Pines? Yeah? Yeah. yeah of course. Yeah, I've known him for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Jonathan, if you're watching, uh, shout out. Um, so, um, yes, he does use something. And then there's a lot of questions here. I'm going to try and bring in like five people's questions into one. Okay. Talking about subtractive EQ versus, you know, um, you know, I, sub I think there's a couple of people sort of saying, and and I and, and I have an opinion on this, so maybe this is what they mean. Like, are you doing subtractive EQ using something with little personality, but then using mm. boosts with something that adds color, maybe a little bit more than just a EQ? Do you have a philosophy on that or a thing that you do more or less of? I, I think that I do just that. I, I uh, Mixing in Pro Tools, I'll, I'll, if I need to remove a frequency or I'm hearing something sound muddy, instead of brightening it, I'll look to find uh, an offending, you know, cluster of frequencies, and I'll I'll dial up the. I mean, nowadays I can kind of say, oh, that's about 380 hertz. That's that that needs to be cleared out, maybe on a guitar or or a kick drum or you know any kind of instrument where there's some low end information or mid range information, and then I will almost always take that out with a uh, McDSP filter bank with a really sharp cue, you know, and I'll 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 just yank out as much as I can just the, the the frequencies and the surrounding frequencies, and then I'll for sure I'll use plugins that have more character um, uh, to you know to roll in some low end or you know you know do things like that. And sometimes I'll I'll filter I'll do like a high pass filter as my first plugin. Right. On, right. on on something like a kick drum, and I'll roll everything out from 80 hertz down at a 12 you know, minus 12 dB, just roll that out and then add it in with a UAD, um, you know, 1073 channel because I want to, I want to lean into that really nice sound in low end. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. I, but Bob Horn was yeah. telling me a similar thing. I I've never tried that. Not, he was talking about doing it stuff like that with vocals. He said that, um, I've, mm, I've, I've never, sure. tr I've never tried that. He said that he trashes it out. He narrows a vocal down and then rebuilds it with EQ. I that do. He likes. I, I do exactly oh, that. You do? I do. I, I do yeah. it on vocals. I do it on kick drums. Um, I don't really do it on snare drums that I can think of, but what I find is that the high and low pass filters that are on, on a lot of equipment, whether it's plug-in or hardware, might not be the one that you actually want to use. And like engaging that that EQ or that filter um, doesn't doesn't always work the way I want it to. And and of course now with digital we can do a, a lot more with that. So I can I can put something uh, again a a higher low pass, you know, like filter bank again F2. And the reason I'm saying that because it's a fairly <laughs> Colin's going to be mad at me for saying this. It's a fairly colorless, you know, uh, plug-in. Uh, and you can, it's, it's pretty surgical, but I go in there and I'll, and I'll roll out a, a bunch of the low end roll off, you know, the, the low end on a kick drum. And then I'll lean into it on the next plugin. Um, I, I could have like, if it's like an SSL channel strip, I could have done that with the filters on the channel itself. But really what it kind of comes down to is it seems like I'm sort of emulating in, in, in a more extreme way what analog tape would do as far as like, you know, removing your high end above a certain range because you know the signal noise ratio just goes nuts or or maybe lopping off some low end um so yeah maybe what i'm doing is 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 narrowing down the frequency range low and high and then again you get to lean into that eq um that's that, that does sound so great on the next plugin no it's fantastic it's great knowledge um and yeah i might try a bit more of that myself i hadn't really thought cool. about it no, yeah that's really great um 
makes sense though, because you you think about a Poltec low end or a Neve ten seventy three low end. Um, they really they have a very specific sound. Somebody somebody asked me once about how do you get the ACDC drum sound, and I was like, just use those EQ points, because you know if you're talking about Back in Black and Highway to Hell. They were made on on consoles that had fixed EQ points. That's right. They wasn't like what we have now. We, you know, they weren't mixing on SSLs at that point. Um, I think SSLs had just come out um, in the late seventies. But yeah, the reality is is that those one that sixty one ten two twenty on the low and low mids is where you want to hear the boost. You want to kick, go to 60. If you want an American yep. low kick sound, go to 50 on an API. And there's, your, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. w- w- I was just, uh, we did a, a breakdown. Um, it's coming out in, in, in probably next week, Eric. And it's, it's all recorded on the Supertramp API in Indiana. And so I was trying to remember all the EQ points. I was like, wait there, wait there. Let's just go and look up a 550. And I'm like, okay, so it's a 50 boost and a 400 cut on the kick drum. It's just because yeah. it's like... That's it. That's all you get. <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's yeah. a good roadmap, I think, for lots of people. If you're trying to get a certain sound, I mean, right. that's, that is where emulations start to be good. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm waffling on. Let's see if we can find... There's so many great questions here. Trying to uh, pull them all together. Uh, people liked our Velvet Underground references and our, our Krautrock references. <laughs> Sorry to call it Krautrock. That was just a nickname. It does sound a little demeaning now, doesn't it? Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I called it that forever. But, yeah, we, yeah, we all did. Let's Motoric. Be we'll call it Motoric. How about yeah. that? I mean, <laughs> all I can tell you is when I went to, uh, went to Berlin uh, last year, I just had a blast. And go to Hans's mm-hmm, Studios mm-hmm. where they made... You know, Heroes oh, yeah. and all oh, those great Depeche Mode records and everything. It was yeah. awe-inspiring. So d- the German music of the 70s was, you know. The best. The best. It really it was. was. Yeah. And, and it's what, between that and the New York Detroit, you take New mm. York and Detroit of the late 60s, early 70s, put it together with the German music of the late 60s and 70s, that is new wave and punk rock. That's mm-hmm. that's all I we did. It, that. That's what all the British did. We just stole from the Germans and the Americans. I appreciate that. <laughs> we're pretty aware made of it, it no you made it better i mean you did the same thing in the 50s into the 60s i mean you know american blues artists were you know couldn't get arrested here in america but you, they'd go to england and and they were you know rock stars and treated oh, yeah. with the respect you know so muddy waters he loved the rolling stones because he finally got to make some money you know oh, and, it, and, it was, and it was their interpretation of that that they then brought back to the united states so anyway, next question. Let's figure it out. Yeah. What's going on? So Bra- uh, um, Chaz got another good question. Um, yeah, because this is an interesting. He said, how do you approach stereo drum beats and loops in a mix? What is your approach to adding energy and excitement to it? Um, and you said, do you ever use mid-side processing on them? Uh, boy, that's a good question. I, I don't do a lot of mid-side processing. Um, I just, it just, it's something, it's a technique that never really took with me. And I've got friends who swear by it and use it all the time. I, I just, you know, I'm, I I mean, I hate to admit this. I'm really meat and potatoes, you know, like kick and snare up to center. Um, Angus over here, Malcolm's over here (laughs) and you, you know, and vocal and Bon Scott comes up the center and you've got yourself a rock record. Um, that's you know maybe I shouldn't admit to that, but that's really uh, that's really what works for me a lot. And and there's degrees of panning that go on, you know, within there. I mean, do you hard pan those rhythm guitars if they're a complete double? Then you can hard pan them. But sometimes coming from 100 to 90 or 91 um, hard pan makes a huge difference, you know, and sounds a little more glued together. Having said that, I do work with a lot of stereo loops, like we all do, and um, it really depends um, on the choruses. Uh, I might go to, you know, hard stereo or find a plugin that'll actually, you know, stretch it out and make it wider. And maybe that's a mid side processing sort of thing. But, um, and I collapse it during the verses, um, maybe completely to mono. Um, I do a lot of manipulating it again. If I'm mixing something and I've been given a loop that, you know, will go along with drums, um, then, then I do a little more sculpting. And the idea maybe is that it gets more stereo at the chorus, but that's, that's not a, that's not a hard and fast rule for me. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I find one of the biggest issues I for me when it comes to like loop and organic instruments mixing together is the decision-making process of how you make them sit uh, rhythmically together. 
one of mm. one of the things I still love about mid early nine early to mid nineties is a massive attack and Portishead and stuff is they seem to make that whole world make sense. It mm. just you listen to anything from that period, tricky solo record. You listen all to right. it and you hear all these samples and looped based stuff, you know, into an Akai or an you know, and 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 then they're playing guitars with it and singing along with it, and it all makes absolute sense. And now I listen to music and it seems like that's combining those elements, it seems like there's too much either taking your band and editing them tight to the loop or mm-hmm. taking the loop and trying to make it fit with the band. It, it, it seems like it seems like it's probably more in the production than the mix is what I'm really saying. It's like making mm, sure mm. that if there's a loop that the band is tracking to it and there's a groove and there's a feel and there's a responsiveness coming from the loop. I think I, I understand what you're saying, Chaz. If somebody sends you something like that, trying to make it make sense because they didn't make sense of it in the production is always going to mm. be difficult. And what I have found I like to do is sometimes chop one of those elements up i much prefer moving a loop to fit a drum kit than fitting a drum making a drum kit fit a loop to be honest yeah and to that end um you know for a long time it was recycle that's what i was using and i would blow things into uh you know a kai after having chopped it up in recycle and sometimes you know and, and you can spread it across the midi keyboard and i i think recycle still exists in reason right um and i found that really useful then and then we'd, we'd dump that back into the Akai and then play it back. And, uh, and you can uh, adjust, you know, playback in a variety of different ways. And I still do that, mostly with Beat Detective now. So if I've got a loop that's not working with, like, a live drum kit, yeah, for sure. You know, you, you put up a two-bar section or four-bar section. You see where it starts to fall apart. And um, it might be that loop is just jumping on on the two on the snare and you need to just nudge it over. And, and, and that's when you, you, you know, that's when you start to slice things up. And I, I do it in beat detective and it's pretty fast. Um, I did that on this Liz fair single, uh, good side. I was doing that. You know, we were playing to a loop that we found and then we replaced that loop. I played drums to it and I wanted to have nominal, minimal editing of my drumming because I'm so good. <laughs> <laughs> no, we wanted to maintain a loose feel. And I played along to this loop for the whole song. And then just only as time went on, as we added more instruments, hey, you know, that, that section, I really do kind of lag here for half a bar. And then I go in and start to, to tighten them up. But the idea is I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep the inspiration of what I was playing. Sure in the moment is as strong as possible. And oftentimes you start to apply the screws as things goes on, things go on as you get near the end of the production, a couple of days in or a week in, and you're like, man, you know, it's just a little too loosey goosey. I got to tighten it down. Um, so I, I, if, if it's a production that's ongoing from start, you know, soup to nuts, start to finish. Um, I sometimes will start to, uh, you know, apply the, the pressure and, and tighten up rhythmically as we go on, as more elements and there's more slop and it's, it starts to lose the groove, then you need to go back. And there's a lot of revisiting on loop based, um, and live, you know, you know, combination productions. It seems like it's almost like you're constantly sifting, combing through it with a finer tooth comb as you go on. Absolutely. That all makes perfect sense. Um, Great answer. Um, I feel good says, do you search for the vocal balance early in your mix or do you only deal with it at the end and then tweak the instruments? That's actually a really good question. Yeah. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a project that I've just been asked to mix, I put everything up right away and, um, and I'll listen to it as I start to pull everything else together. And, um, uh, for sure. I, I and also, if there's a rough mix, I love to listen to the rough mix and, and, and hear what, you know, the last time these guys were all together in a room, you know, where were their heads at and, uh, specifically for, for vocals. Um, so yeah, vocals are in usually for me early, like initially right away on a, on a record that I'm mixing that I haven't had any involvement with. And then, um, and then I'll mute it and I'll focus on you know, I'll start to like really pay attention to kick drum sounds and snare drum sounds and stuff. But yeah, vocals are kind of a constant. I don't leave those for last really kind of ever. John um, House is asking a question about the song, that, the course that we put up for Hurricane. Mm. He said, uh, how do you approach it when you get printed stems? Meaning a lot of the stuff I gave you was processed, um, you know, 
in the recording stage. So right. I, I remember on that, there was like drum sounds that I had manipulated, vocal sounds, because when we recorded that vocal, and in fact, a lot of a record, we ended up using like the scratches. We ended right. up using like, um, you know, as we're building the songs, because none of the songs came in with that kind of production. They were a vocal acoustic. So we just had fun with the hurricane. We decided, or, or hurricane for the Americans, for hurricane, we decided we wanted it to be, you know, a little bit sort of Motowny Staxy, and we wanted that groove. And, mm -hmm. and, and of course, there was always a part of me that thinks, you know, um, Last for Life, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So it was like, I wanted it to have a little bit of an Iggy kind of, uh, uh, that our version of like a, a modern approach of something like that. And I do remember we ended up processing the vocals super heavily to get them mm -hmm. to sound like the way we wanted. And then when I sent them to you to mix, I gave you that and really sort of waited for your lead. If you didn't like them and you said, give me the original, but you didn't, you, you ended up using that. I think mm -hmm. he, so his question says after that, it says, it, are you always, do you always get, always use what's given to you or do you sometimes remix them? He's only about a third of the way through the course, he says, so maybe he hasn't got to that mm. at the moment. Um, I, well, uh, again, I, I get I get sessions in all kinds of states, and uh, a lot of them are done in GarageBand or Logic. The, maybe the majority are Logic. And um, unlike other mixers that, I've, that I know, I don't really have a lot of... Um, criteria if you're going to send me a mix you know when you're sending me the multi-tracks or the individual people call them stems now um you send me the individual elements um i don't really care whether or not you put um a lot of compression or eq on there i mean if, if it's a, a heavily processed vocal and, and it's so much reverb that i can't really work with it then i'll ask please you know send me a send me that vocal again without the the stuff on it, but most people pull that stuff off or they're using it so minimally that it doesn't really affect, um, you know, my approach much. And I think that uh, hurricane <laughs> <laughs> hurricane was uh, similar where the vocals were processed, but I yeah. was able to go further with it. And had it, had it been more of an issue, I would have talked to you about it, but it wasn't, uh, you know, I sort of followed the lead and, and I added, you know, more compression. I mean, what, where it becomes a problem is if things are kind of, overly squashed and compressed and, or, or there's a distortion that's occurring, you know, maybe that vocal is just so processed by the time I start to put some of the things I like onto it, um, it starts to, you know, overload on input and I can't clip gain that down enough. Um, but I've not really had that problem much. I mean, I've been pretty lucky. People send me pretty usable stuff. Um, Eric's pointing something out to me. Is there a good question I missed? Oh, Natasha uh -oh. says, sorry. Sorry, Natasha. Natasha uh, asks, can you talk about recording? Artists that use a lot of effects to create their signature sound versus artists that are more purists. Do you have mm. a preference? Hmm. I prefer to work with people who uh, pay me. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't ca I don't care. I really don't care. Uh, I mean, some of my favorite records that I've gotten to work on were, you know, to have guitar players with, 20, 30 pedals and there's a whole setup and the drums are, drummers are playing with, you know, with loops and, and they've got a whole system. There's a lot of tech involved. And then some of my favorite are just like, you know, like for instance, like Liz Fair, or Ben Lee, an acoustic guitar and a voice. And then we, and, and that may be it for that song. I don't know. We won't know until we get into the recording. I don't have a preference. I, I prefer to work with people who have, uh, uh, have enough money to hire me. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I've been that way since I started. One of the no, first I things I ever recorded was a mariachi band that wanted to audition for the, uh, the Mexican restaurant, which is in the same building as our studio in 1988. And they came over and buzzed our door. And I, I answered the door and there's four guys in their mariachi outfits with their instruments. And they said in broken English, you know, Hey, are you a recording studio? I said, yes. And they wanted to audition for Maria's uh, Mexican restaurant. And she said, no, we, you know, we, we bring a cassette. So they wanted to pay me $50 to record three songs. And so I had nothing going Fantastic. on. I'm like, sure, why not? I mean, and, and I, my approach has not changed. Whoever shows up via email or rings my doorbell or calls me on the phone, the, I'll record them. I, 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 the process of, of, of setting up microphones and, and mixing things is almost, for me, almost independent of my taste, you know. Yeah. I, I agree. I think I think you're hitting exactly on it. I, I love bands that come in 
Dave, Dave Jordan was the one that made it okay for me because when I worked with him as a musician, I was like, and all musicians do this to me when their first experience, um, I'm sure you have this happen. They come in and they go, oh, you know, I'll just give you my clean sound and you work with it. And I'm like, mm. okay, if that's what you want, but what, what do you normally use? And then they might say, mm -hmm. well, I've got this special amp and I've got these four pedals I use. And I'm like, well, I want to hear that first. I want to hear yeah, what, what, yeah. what you have sculpted and created. But artists, 100%. But artists can be a little overwhelmed, especially if they start working with, with guys like you, you know, and you've got credits and they admire your work, they may get a little timid around you. Like, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to pretend that I know better than you. And, and I'm like, no, I, I, I learn more from 18 year olds than I do from myself. You know what I mean? Cause somebody right. comes in, they're hearing music with totally different ears for the first time. You know, my, my son's 13. He, he reintroduces me to music all the time and hears it in yeah. a totally different way. And it's amazing. And, and, and kids now in particular are so eclectic, so eclectic, yep. far more eclectic I, than we were. <laughs> but I, but, but, but the, uh, Natasha, it was Natasha, right? Yes, she, Natasha. she asked, she, uh, she asked if I had a preference and I, I really don't. Hmm. I mean, um, uh, again, singer songwriters, you're more likely to encounter a voice and a song and some sort of instrument, guitar, piano, some sort of keyboard. And, then and that's that, usually, and that's allows it, you to have some right? fun. Then you get to right, have some but, fun and play instruments. But a band like a band like Touche and More, those guitar players have, you know, they have their guitars dialed in, they have their sounds dialed in, they have their pedal boards worked out, and and they've already hammered a lot of that out. So um, it really depends on the artist. I don't, I, I do not have a preference. So uh, like I, I kind of take it as it uh, as it arrives. And if my pedal collection um, and the amps that I've got. Uh, are are utilized that's fantastic if none of them are touched because they have their own thing that's fine too you know i, I really don't care you know I'm, I'm after the song really you know? you know there's 450 people watching you at the moment wow is that a lot yeah it's great it's okay. great continuous <laughs> views at any one time it's pretty pretty oh, darn nice. amazing all yep. right uh, so um to those 450 people, would you hit the like button? And if you can, share and let other people know. That would be amazing. You're um, supposed to say smash the like button. Smash uh, it, right? Sm or yeah. they, uh, smash that like button. Okay. They say that on YouTube all the time. Smash it. I'm not very good. I I, I do these things. I, I'm. I, it's a constant struggle between being English, particularly British English, yeah. and having a YouTube channel. <laughs> They're like two you know? di diametrically opposed things. Yeah. I think uh, everybody it's, it's – it's, uh, Australians do really good with it. Like, so like Ozzy man, I watch him and he's like, he's really good at that. He's because well, smash, he's Australian. smash the like button, mate. Yeah. Smash it, mate, mate. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. He's really good at that. He's uh, but he's Australian. So they're good at everything. You know? Yeah. They're, 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 they're good at cricket. <laughs> no, I'm a huge cricket uh, fan. That's a whole other discussion. Uh, more questions. Yeah. So, Adam, so, yes, please like and share. If you can hit the like button, that would be amazing. Thank you ever so much. We really appreciate it. Um, so, Adam Stewart says, what is it going to take to get Nina and Louise back in the studio this year? <sighs> well, well, we have to get past the pandemic. <laughs> we have to get past that first. But I would love, I would love to work with them again. Uh uh, that Veruca Salt record, Ghost Notes, which uh, came out 2016, I think that might be the my favorite engineering uh, of anything I've worked on. Um, I, I love the sound of that record. That was a that was literally a labor of love. It was a, a, a group of old old friends who hadn't been in the same room in like you know 20 years, and really it been that it, long. Oh god, that was amazing, and the fact that they they thought to ask me to helm this reunion was uh moving and my hair in my arms is standing up i love them i love that record and i i, I there, there should be more i don't know what it's going to take it's uh they're really busy people uh, only only nina and louise live in the same city la um steve and jim are you know chicago and orange county so it's logistically tough. They all have uh, Orange County is not so bad. Chicago is well, a little different. But they have jobs and careers and spouses, and some most have kids, uh, and see. and they you know life is moving on. And um, you know the one thing that they have not ever done is to just phone it in. Like every every album or EP in their discography um, is 
hard fought and they really mean it. I mean, that's, that's really, they got a pretty sterling catalog. If you're a Veruca Salt fan, you know, like there's no letdowns. <laughs> They're all great. Yeah. I, and, I, uh, I played and, with them in England. We, uh, we opened for them and did some shows together. Yeah. Nice. Long yeah. Uh, but I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what it's going to take to get them together. I mean, um, uh, I don't know, um, time, you know, and, uh, and, and free calendar space. So yep, I hear yeah. you. Love uh, them. Thank you, Adam, for that question. Um, AJ says, um, hi, Brad. From your course, I really like the concept that you have on mixing bass guitars and utilizing the sub. Was this something you learned on your own? Yeah. Thanks, AJ. Uh, you mean the subwoofer? Uh, yep. Just, yep. Yeah. Uh, that's just something, trial and error, you know, just messing around um, when I first finally broke down and bought one. Um, and I bought an inexpensive one. I didn't spend a lot of money because it didn't seem like a subwoofer should cost a lot. Technologically, they're easily the simplest of of the speaker element family, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They, Which one do you have? I I have the cheap I Yamaha one that was $119 from Best Buy. I, I went to Circuit City. Uh, rest in peace, Circuit City, right? They're gone now, I think. I don't Where know. It? Good. Yeah, maybe. It's the, it was like the red, the, they have a big yep. red building. It's a circuit. Yeah, they're gone, I think. At least oh. the Los Angeles, the one in LA I bought mine from. I don't know who makes it. I've forgotten. It was $200. Um, oh, you got, so, got a posh one at $200. Uh, yeah, posh. <laughs> so, so, but, but turning it on and off, trying to figure out the settings, um, that was just trial and error. I wanted to hear what was going on down low. I do it all the time. I'll just put the sub on, especially with stuff I'm mixing that I have not recorded. I want to see what's going on down there. Um, and it would usually with an eye towards clearing out some of that super low end. Well, a couple of things quickly, guys and girls. Um, yes, please up with the keep up with the questions. Um, I just did all the super chat. So if you want to do a super chat, I'll make sure you get to the top of the list. So if you want to hit the super chat um, and please like and share, hit that like button and share this. It's great having all of you here. Um, I feel good said, have you ever worked on a project as a producer where the artist had a completely different vision on the way you thought it should be you've got to have done that yes yes are you allowed to say who please yeah they um <laughs> please <laughs> i i i think that i i working with billy corrigan on the adore sessions i think that we had initially uh very sympathetic ideas you know we we agreed upon upon the approach to the record and i think that it was where we uh where we finally re fell out of sync uh was in how to accomplish that and and the process of getting to that sound um but we weren't necessarily uh out of sync with how it was supposed to sound and 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 the subsequent release that came out like a year later sounds a lot like what we discussed so um i don't know if i've got uh, I haven't really, other than the Smashing Pumpkins record, I don't think I've ever been fired off a record. Um, I didn't know that you so, were fired. Well, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to go to Los Angeles with them to record. And he showed up at the house to, uh, to discuss this. And, um, uh, and my wife and I had agreed that I was going to, if, if, if he didn't fire me, he was going to, uh, I was going to say, I don't want to go. And so he said, okay, so Los Angeles. And, uh, he looks at me and I'm right before I say like, I don't want to go. He goes, you're not coming with. <laughs> and I was like, God damn it. You know, I, I was going <laughs> to, I was going to quit. But anyway, technically I got fired. So, um, I was let go. I was relieved of my right. watch and that's fine. I don't really care. That's how it works. It didn't work out. Um, uh, I'm proud of what we accomplished in the time we worked together and it's, it, it's all on there. Um, uh, what, but, but the, the question was w a vision aspect, you know, you'd have to, I think you'd have to ask the artist because I'm pretty malleable. There may be some, there may be some records by, uh, but with some, with some bands or artists I've worked with who are like, you know, this is, you know, they haven't really translated live. I don't know if, uh, it's worked out completely. I don't think I'm that pushy of a producer. Like, you know, what this song really needs, Ben Lee is a bunch of 808, you know, drum programs and, a chorus of singing chimpanzees, you know, like, like, <laughs> like I, I don't usually push my agenda production wise much. Um, but having said that, I'm not always aware because I'm in a pretty privileged position as a record producer, as a white male record producer of a certain age and a certain discography. I think that I express that privilege without knowing. So you'd have to ask 
specifically the artists, you know, maybe they can chime in and say, yeah, you, you, you push me into a box that I didn't want to be in. I, I hope I haven't done that. Um, is that a weird way to answer? Or no, no, no. That's, that's a great answer. I think, yeah, we have to be very self-aware. Um, I think that's for th those uh, watching here. I think that's that's the the beauty of uh, experience, age and experience, but definitely acquired knowledge, is that you understand your own shortcomings. I try to help a lot of people as they first start, um, because technology has made it uh, easy is the wrong word, uh, more available. Uh, more accessible to record. I don't like saying the word easier because that implies that 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 horrible fallacy that everybody used to be a genius and now nobody isn't. And I, I, that's just not fair. <laughs> I think if anything, there's probably more talent than there ever was because there's more encouragement. You know, when I was a kid, yeah, there was like five of us in my town that played guitar and that mm -hmm. was amazing. Um, now the accessibility is that anybody, if they could, could play guitar. But anyway, um, my point is, is like, not to just rely on the technical aspect, meaning when you first start using a DAW, you can make everything in tight and in tune. Everything can be perfectly timed and perfectly tuned. Um, as you get more experienced, you realize you know when to back off of those skills that you learn. And that's mm. really... So what you're saying is, is about being self-aware. It's about going, okay, when I was younger, I probably had these five methods I knew how to make a record. And now, 25 years later, I have about 10,000 ways to make a record. And the mm -hmm. biggest one is sometimes knowing just when to let go and encourage the artist, you know, rather than just applying my ideas. So I think, I think we're all guilty of that, no matter what our, you know, race, creed, denomination, beliefs are, is that right. we, 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 te techniques are important, but we have to remember they are purely just techniques. They're not artistry. Yep. That's a very, very deeply intellectual answer or philosophical answer to a question like, you know, you know, sometimes these questions open up a deeper conversation Definitely. that has more to do with um, how you relate with people on a one to one basis. You know, this is a work relationship, ultimately. And I'm, you know, I am their employee, you know, uh, uh, so but, but we're also trying to hopefully create art, something that that the artist will then have to live with forever. So, um, you know, Liz Fair brought this up again. I keep using her because I just finished this record, but she, she was really struck hard. She told me in 2016 with the, the, the death of David Bowie and then Prince, especially Prince, because it was sudden. And it, and the contrast she said between the two artists, the one had time to think about his mortality and, and infuse his final recording with, um, you know, with that knowledge and, and Prince didn't get that, although he was prolific right up until the day he died. But, um, but there's no like final Prince album where he knew that his time had come. And she said to me, I, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> but she had said her, her manager had said to her, you know, Hey, you know, we all need to think about this. Like if anytime you're making any kind of art, if it's a book you're writing or if it's a, an album you're making, are you willing to let this be? If, if your life comes to an end, you know, unexpectedly your final say mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's heavy, but that infused the process of recording this record. She wants every song on this record to count towards her, you know, towards her catalog, to her legacy. And, 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 and we should always feel that way. Right. Um, it's impossible to carry, I think that kind of intensity all the time, but, but she hired me to make this record. I am her employee. And just like Billy Corgan was just like me without you or Sarah Bettens, um, you know, any singer songwriter, they hire me with an idea. I want to have something happen with you at the end of our time as employer employee, there's supposed to be a finished group of songs. And w my job as the employee is to make sure that, that they're happy with it because they got to live with it for the rest of their lives. And even beyond that. So, you know, like, like Liz, Liz is thinking about what might happen after she's gone. She's already experienced what it's like to put a record out and have people talk about it for a quarter century, kind of nonstop. She's super fortunate and she's not complaining about it, but she's still to this day wrestling with the legacy of that, knowing that, that she may be 
talked about and and people you know making decisions about whether or not she's a good artist or her stuff matters and she's taking it seriously she's grabbing it and she's embracing it and she's wrestling with it and my job as the employee is to just help the artist whether it's the first time in the studio or like you know a couple decades in to help realize some sort of vision you know i mean yeah have i made mistakes absolutely but but ultimately i like to think that the vast majority of the albums I've worked on, those artists are happy with those. Career yeah. peak. I'm always shooting for the career peak, right? Yeah. You're, you're, oh God, you're opening so many questions up going <laughs> through my mind. Because I'm thinking about it. You know, you talk of Bowie. I feel like, yes, I, I agree with that analogy that, you know, he, he realized he was dying of cancer and he made this, this work of art. Um, however, I do feel like you at any point, if you stopped Bowie's career because he went into every album pushing boundaries and, and trying to do something new that I think he was a very fortunate artist. I don't know I don't know many, it's a handful of artists, literally five or six artists that I would put in that category. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's pretty tiny for me. So um, not that there aren't many other great singer, songwriter, you know, band, you know, bands, whatever you want to say, that that great, create great music. But there's something right. quite unique about Bowie. Oh, and for sure. Yeah, but, and Prince was, you know, even more prolific than David Bowie. But I would venture to say that he was a little bit indiscriminate with his process. I mean, I I I don't like the majority of what he put out from like. 1997 on um, you know uh, that's not my favorite Prince stuff and I I would have enjoyed more of his output had he maybe slowed down a little bit I don't know <laughs> I mean right, it's right. it's it's hard I mean he hit a high watermark and held it for so long an incredible body of work but more more what I was talking about was was that as an employee and I'm always <laughs> an employee in these situations Absolutely, like the yeah. artist the artist is always the employer and that is the dynamic that I try to remember and I'm trying to stay mindful that this may be the only time this artist gets it together. This band makes a record. And so it doesn't matter if Very these important. guys are getting, yeah. you know, I mean, this is super important to them. Yeah. And it may just be, you know, something that maybe I don't creatively connect with for a variety of reasons. But that is not my, that is not their problem. My problem is even, to. Even more know, so, just to take your point and, and accept, mm. to exemplify it even more, singers. Because the thing is, is like I, I, I've I've sung, meaning you know I've written songs, but I'm not a lead singer. Lead singers, whole different thing. That's your voice. That is your God-given whatever your beliefs are, but that's your voice. As mm -hmm. a guitar player, I can go and play on a funk song, or I can go and play some metal, or I can play some country. I can mm -hmm. adapt, and I can be in, and I had been in. 10 different bands. I had five different record deals in my career <laughs> and with three different bands, you mm -hmm. know, so I can adapt and none of them were the same genre. They were variations maybe, but with a singer, unless you decide you're going to be a rapper next week, the reality is, is like, that's your voice. So it's very, yeah. uh, you're, you're touching on an incredibly important point of the responsibility we have as producers. When somebody walks in that door, especially the singer or a mm -hmm. singer is like, this might be their shot. They don't get that many chances to mm -hmm. get themselves out there and, and have people connect with them. And so, yes, we have to be very, very mindful of that. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Hey, let's get there's, there's Earlier on, there was a couple of questions, and I, 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 I forgot about them, and I'm going to bring them back up. There was quite a few okay. people asking about the employment of parallel compression. Mm. Uh, I use it. Yep. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's to do that sort of stuff we're talking about, that extra aggression and excitement that you get in a live room. It brings yeah. that. Yeah, now you, you know, you, you're, you're talking about parallel compression for uh, for any instrument or, or specifically like drums? You, you, you tell us. I mean, uh, there's, because there's I, three different questions I, on it. Like, like, uh, like, like our friend Ken Sluter, he uses parallel compression all over the place. And I know that... Uh, Jack Joseph Puig does, and you know a lot of the great mixers do, and that includes with vocals. I don't do parallel compression with vocals at all. I, I've I've messed around with it, and I'll read an article, um, you know, <laughs> depending on what year it is, and I'll be like, oh my god, I got to get I got to get better at that. I need to experiment with that. And I always uh, pull away from it, um, but I do use parallel compression 
for drums. And it's uh, currently it's a separate output, um, and I can feed um, I can feed kick or snare or toms into it. Um, sometimes I'll put bass guitar into it to sort of you know help glue the uh, the bass guitar with the, the uh, with the kick drum. Um, and if I'm doing it with toms and I want to have the the toms panning, it means I have to you know with the uh, initial tom track it's like a low tom and it needs to be panned a little harder as it because because my additional parallel output is coming up the center it's a mono um uh signal and that goes through a distressor that's just dedicated to uh to whatever comes through output three on my you know i have stereo drums one two coming out uh, stereo percussion and then i have a mono output coming out of uh, pro tools and that goes straight into a distressor compressor and um, and I do use it. Yeah. I don't engage it right away. Um, I'll start to, I'll start to put things into that parallel. If I'm having, if I'm finding myself really enjoying the way the drums sound, but I'm reaching to hear that kick drum or that snare drum, that's when I start to pull this thing up. And sometimes I'll add even more compression onto that send, um, for a little more dramatic effect. But usually I don't, it's usually a pretty dry, pretty uncompressed, just sort of unmolested, um, sound of whatever I put into it, kick and snare, sometimes bass guitar, sometimes toms. Um, but I don't use it on guitars and I never use it on vocals. So I do employ it, but it's almost always a percussive thing. Um, absolutely. It makes perfect sense. I, I, I've parallel compressed on, I think one vocal recently, um, like a year ago recently. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I have tried it. I, I tend to try and do more of that going in. If I'm trying to get that mm. uh, going in. So I, okay. I hear exactly what you're saying. Mm. Um, I feel good says, uh, thanks for the answer. It was great. Have you ever faced the fear of giving a mix to an artist that could not be good enough for your um, for your taste? How do you deal with it? Sorry, let me read that again. Mm. Have you ever faced sure. the fear of giving a mix to artists that could not be good enough for your taste? I think they're trying to say, and I'm sorry if I'm paraphrasing you here with your question, is maybe doing something that they want that you that you don't think is good enough, like uh, being directed to do something, and you're. Oh, I yeah, think that's the sure. Un- that would make sense out of that question. You know what I mean? Sure, I think as I've gotten older and uh, my tastes have have evolved, um, I sometimes am asked to make things sound like where my head was at in 1990 or 1988 or 1995. And, um, and, uh, yeah, there's times when, uh, I have to, like, I have to take my hands away. Um, there's again, this woman, Liz, who I worked with, you know, I'd be sitting like this working on something and she would, she must've done it a hundred times. She'd walk up behind me and she put her hands on my shoulders and she would pull me back from the, she's like, you know, don't, don't touch it. It's perfect. Like, do not add any more of whatever it is that you think you need to add. Um, and yeah, there are times when I send a mix that I know I could have gone further with, but the artist is really feeling this version. There's even, again, I'm going to use Liz because we just finished it and it took us many months to make this record where she would say, okay, where you've got this mix right now, I don't like nearly as much as the one that you, you know, the rough mix you sent from two months ago. So let's just scrap all that hard work you've just done <laughs> and, and reopen the session that was from May 16th and we'll open that up and you start from there. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm constantly learning constantly. Like uh, I'm not afraid. You mentioned fear. I'm not afraid to send a mix. Uh, like, well, are people going to think that I'm not very good at what I do? If this mix comes out this way, um, I'm not afraid of that because I've, had a long career and there's all kinds of records that I've worked on. And, and I think my, my production style is all over the map. So some stuff is really sonically pristine and some stuff is really grungy and dirty. And there's levels that, you know, I, I was learning on the job. So, <laughs> and, uh, and, and my tastes have changed. So I'm never really afraid to send a mix along, but there are times when I know that I have to like stop my obsessive quality. And again, Pro Tools and digital audio workstations allow you to to get obsessive in a way that I don't think you could with analog unless you're like Steely Dan or something, right? So I'm not afraid of it, but I, I there are times when I know I'm sending a mix that I – maybe I think it's undercooked, but the artist, the client is loving it. So, yeah, I'll so, do it. 
It's yeah. interesting, yeah, because I, I I understand. I was thinking Mutt Lang, uh, other than Mutt Lang. Oh yeah, Mutt, Mutt Lang right. in, in analog was insane from what I could tell. Yeah, he never he he never held back, and neither did Roy Thomas Baker. I mean, those guys are just geniuses. Yeah. But, but I also that's a style of production that I don't necessarily yeah. want to emulate. Right. You know. Um. So DJ uh, Kroji says. Um, he says, at this time where practicing is available to all artists everywhere, would you still um, waste time fixing the take instead of having it redone, even drums? Um, so I think, I think what he's saying, if I can sort of like wrangle it, I feel like, do you ever go back to somebody and say, look, I can fix this. <laughs> I can fix what you sent me, but why don't you just replay it? Because... It's easier when you're producing because I feel like one of our jobs is to also educate and help our artists. I love right. it when an artist comes in and works with me for a few weeks and then leaves like a better musician, a better songwriter. Absolutely. That, that yeah. feels so good. Um, that's different than what he's asking, though, I think. So yeah. in the moment, you, you can... You, you yeah, can, that's what I'm saying. You, How do you, you employ know, you can, that when you're mixing? In the moment, yeah, when you're just mixing and it's yeah. something that's really rough... I've never sent that I can think of. I've never sent something back saying, hey, look, I can't work with this. I've, uh, uh, I take a perverse pleasure <laughs> in taking whatever I've been handed. Yeah. And you know, like going, well, now what the hell were they thinking here? You know, like I'll put my, you know, I mean, I, I, I I'm a sucker for that. I kind of like the basket cases, you know, like I, yeah. and I've come across some really rough ones. And I just love the idea of making it sound like, you know, I'm going to find out what it was that you were actually kind of going for. I don't know what this vocal melody was meant to be, but we're going to we're going to melody the living crap out of this and make it sound great and natural. I, I, I you know, I enjoy that. I I don't think I, I can't think of a, a time when I've sent something back saying, hey, try it again. I I, you know, but also I, I it's the puzzle solving aspect of it that I like. I, I like trying to make sense of it, you know. It's fun. And sometimes you can do really cool stuff. You find out that like, like maybe even unintentional, you know, a really noisy guitar track that's really, really almost unusable. And then you find out that if you put it through enough weird boxes and plugins that it, it turns out into this crazy thing. And you're like, oh my God, this sounds like public. I mean, this sounds like, who's the guitar player for public image limited? Like, like this almost like accidental, accidentally amazing. Well, some of the stuff. best stuff, strangely enough, was Steve Vai. Steve Vai played with Pill. Oh right, well, on the and on did the, some amazing yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, on generic. Yeah, for on me, album. Yeah. for me, I feel like outside of uh, John Lydon, of course, um, I would say Ja Wobble, obviously, for that insane, oh, yeah. same bass playing. Those, those to me are like right. But yeah. But so I think that I mm -hmm. think uh, I, I, to answer the question, I don't think I've ever sent anything back. Mm -hmm. um, but I've definitely, you know, put the screws to uh, a drummer or a guitar player in the moment. I would yeah. rather have them, like you said, learn how to be a better musician by the time they finish their time working with me. That's, that's always the goal is, you know, uh, uh, you know, not, you know, imparting some wisdom, but also like, Hey, hey you want to come in and see how it gets done. Here's how it gets done. And a lot of it just has to do with repetition. The, the 10,000 hours concept where we want to call it what we used to call it as a kid. So yeah, I can play the crap out of a saxophone, you know? Um, uh, unfortunately there's not a lot of call in my <laughs> current job for somebody who can play like all of Charlie Parker's solos and 12 keys. It doesn't really, you know, it doesn't help, but I you know what Don it's like. You can play Donna Lee in 12 different keys. Uh, uh I actually got on stage with Prince once and played uh, Donna Lee. You with did? Him. <laughs> yeah. His tempo was too fast. And I, I, that's a story for another time but um you, it's a couple of, idea, you, you know you're geeks but, when but, people can we can sing saxophone solos yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a rehearsal thing that again if you're yeah. going to make make an album with me soup to nuts that pre-production mm -hmm. yeah i'm going to be doing things like telling the guitar players and the singer not to show up. I'm just going to work with bass and drums and we're going to work on these songs and we're going to break the tempos down to half speed or slower because that's what my saxophone teachers did with me. Hey, you can't play this at 138 BPM. Let's try 79. Let's just go to, you know, like this, take it half speed, you know, and, and, and then we'll work our way up and let's not have any guitars and let's not have any vocals. And then it's amazing with these, you know, blast beats, really fast tempo, punk rock, hardcore bands. They start to hear, the bass and drums are like, oh, wait a second. So you, what are you doing there? Oh, oh. And they start to learn not only about themselves playing at half speed, but also what their 
you know, what the other half of the, uh, you know, the tugboat is, you know, when, when you're a rhythm section. Um, uh, so yeah, I prefer to have these musicians figure it out before we ever hit, you know, record, but as a mixer, I've never sent anything back. That's a long answer, sir. No, 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 no. It's a fantastic answer. Um, I was, there's, there's a couple of the war stories ones. What's been the longest session with a musician or vocalist trying to obtain a good take? Can I answer that for you? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Answer it. You know the answer. I know the answer. Every, everybody knows the answer if they've been watching if they've been watching this. <laughs> Let's just say it's a rather famous singer guitar player who very famously everybody I know has ever worked with him has said it takes hundreds of takes to get good vocal hundreds. takes. Hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. Maybe but, uh 230, I think, was the, 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 the that's, you'd have to ask Bjorn Thorsrud. I still have the notes somewhere in a box. I think I did 230 some takes of, of, of Billy Corgan singing. No, he said the his same, name. The same, no, I, I don't <laughs> mind saying it. He, he would say, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and we, we took, we took some real crazy pleasure in, in trying to make that happen. And he, and it was, it was, it was interesting. It was interesting. And eventually we were comping like, okay, let's take one, take 197 and take 195 and see how they combine, you know, <laughs> it was wild. It was, uh, it, it was, a, a, another way of making a record. There's more than one way. There's hundreds. There's maybe definitely infinite. one way. Yeah. yeah. It's like, what's interesting is you say that because I, I have this, uh, analogy that I, I, this phrase that I always use for making records. And I say, uh, you know, listening to, uh, uh, the song should sound like you're dressing like a hipster. What I mean by that is like, you know how like the, the guys, you know, we live in LA, so we, we, we know a lot. The guys with like the sort of like perfectly imperfect haircut that looks like yeah. they just got out of bed, but it's also like the most perfect just got out of bed with the with the T-shirt that's like, you know, a, a 1950s Disneyland T-shirt. Yeah, you know, perfectly, perfectly sort of de decrepit and sort of rock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and basically... I know, uh, I, I I know these people. We, we we know them. We know them well. And it's it's mm -hmm. it's three hours of strategically getting the hair and the beard and everything to be yeah. waxed just perfectly imperfect. And frankly, you know, all joking aside, that is what our music should sound like. It should sound like it just happens to be brilliant, as opposed to like, oh right. my god, I can tell just how much work they did to that. I want to put something on and listen to it and go, wow, and have that feeling of just like, they just went into a studio and they made this beautiful sounding record. I don't want it to sound like it's a schnizzle ton of work. I want it to mm -hmm. just, I mm -hmm. want it, effortless is the wrong way of explaining it. There's a much better, I'm sure you can come up with a better analogy than mm -hmm. me, but do you know what I mean? That's what I want to hear. I want to hear the essence of an artist and it doesn't matter is what I'm trying to say if it took four months to get a vocal that sounds like it's just natural. Because it's a, uh, you know, um, the the Liz record we we just did and again. I'm using this again and again because it's the last big record I've worked on. So uh, and also really unique. She's a singer songwriter, so it's all about her words. And she edits as she goes. And yeah, I bet we might have tracked to answer. Go back to this question. I bet I've tracked on a couple of these songs, forty or fifty complete takes of Liz. Um, and every one of them, when you listen back, uh, when the album finally comes out, you listen back to it, they all sound really casual. <laughs> and and what would happen is that she would, you know, sing on a Tuesday on a song that we had pieced together on Monday. And then she would come back in a day later and uh, would sit in the chair here in the control room and sing four more times all new lyrics or maybe all new choruses and or maybe all new melodies. And then go away, do a tour, come back three weeks later and then scrap all of that and do all new again. And eventually with almost every one of these songs, the final two takes were the, were the doubled takes that make up the finished thing. So, you know, there may be 19 or 20 or 30, uh, of her complete vocals and we're using take 29 and take, th take 30. And then I go in and, and, you know, if there's a little dropped temp uh, timing thing you know fix a little bit but um that's a totally different way and uh, of 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 recording um and it involves 
against somebody who, as far as, as long as I've worked with her, she's always taken advantage of the time in between sessions. So, uh, Exxon and Guyville took nine months to make. Um, we weren't working continuously on that. We were working when we had time. Um, and then we, we really drilled down the last four weeks and, and made that record once the, once the label was secured and we had like a, a real vision. But she would come in and re-sing a vocal that had been done for three months. And it would just be better every time. And she, she made good use of that time in between. So I don't, I don't have any problem with a long vocal session, as long as you spread it out over months. I mean, but like a 16-hour day and cutting 200 or 300 vocals uh, of, of exactly the same, as far as I can tell, that's a little strange. Those are rare. Um, uh, uh, I, but, you know, I, I think that uh, trying like, to achieve some sort of spontaneity in the playback is, is really important. I don't, I, I too don't like to really hear all the blood, sweat and tears. I mean, occasionally there's an exception, but I like to, things to sound like they're inspired and they're fresh. I think that's what I, why I love London calling more than almost any rock record ever made, or maybe it is my f- most favorite rock record. And so many people it is, and it's 40 years old this year and I put it on and I still get great enjoyment out of it because, because they rode that, I think they rode that line between overcooking it and, going with initial takes and that's uh, says a lot about you know the team that was involved with making that record it's it's inspired and it's sloppy when it needs to be sloppy and it's tight and punches you in the gut when it needs to do that uh, you 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 realize you mentioned uh i think three albums now <clears throat> that they have different producers but have the same engineer and who's a i'm a big fan of it but unfortunately died a few years ago a couple yeah. of years ago bill price yeah bill i, I mean one of the one of probably one of the greatest engineers that ever lived, and yeah, Lon- London Calling, never mind the bollocks. For me, the Pretender's first two records. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. and he's the common yeah. thread with all of those albums. Yeah, I it, no surprise, and uh, uh, just the one record alone. And take any one of those, and that would be mm-hmm. enough to hang your entire career on. If you yeah. you know for guys for guys like you and me, yeah. he had all of those, you know, and more. But for me, London Calling was. The, is the most important record in my career, in my life, really, you know, um, like it, rock record. It's number one. It's the thing that it's, it's the, I was a clash fan already, but, but sort of just peripherally, but it was the record that cemented it for me. Like, Oh, you know, lyrically, these guys are saying important things. I, I love the energy and, and it's all over the map stylistically, but none of it to my ears sounds forced. It all seems like an organic, sort of response to how they grew up and where they were living and what they were listening to as kids and as adults. It was, it's just genius, you know? And yeah, Mr. Price, what it, wow, so I, good. Yeah. I'm, I, right. I, I just uh, decided to wiki him. And for those mm-hmm. um, that want to do that, I mean, obviously he did user illusion one and two as well. So he was the, <laughs> he was the engineer, he was the engineer on a mixer on that. You well, know, we can't. We're all. Not every album's a winner. <laughs> I, I, I really don't like that. No, but really, my, my, he engineered that. Yeah, and mixed it. So, uh, but, but you understand? Like, talk <laughs> about talk about eclectic. It goes back yeah, to that whole yeah. idea. You know what I mean? Wow. But yeah, he's 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 a who's who. I mean, he's got because yeah. he started off in the '60s <laughs> at uh, Decca and Wessex. He was the chief engineer wow. at Wessex, but I know he was at Decca in the '60s. So I think I think. Somebody can correct me. I think it doesn't say on Wikipedia, but I think he did Hey There, Delilah. I think he's... Wow. Yeah, I think he's Tom Jones, Big Tom Jones Records. Yeah. I know in the 70s, the, the wiki's not very good, but I do know in the 70s a lot of that, the, a lot of the insane 70s uh, British prog rock that I love. He was an engineer on a lot of those records. So right. he engineered a ton of prog. Um, I think he's Mott the Hoople. It's not insane his thing here, but... wow. Um, Nymphs, Waterboys, Jesus and Mary Chain, Sparks, Sex Pistols. I mean, wow. yeah, yeah, he's eclectic. I think it speaks to you know because a couple, a few people have been asking variations on a theme of this question, and mm-hmm. the question, that, and I get asked this personally myself as well. So I'm going to leave this entirely to you. People saying to me, "What do you do when you don't like the music, but it's a good payday?" <laughs> Uh, I focus on the engineering, making sure that it sounds great. Um, focus on, um, you know, the personalities of the people that you're working with. Um, so much of what I derive as far as enjoyment in a, in a 
album production is the time spent with the people that, you know, that have hired me that are, you know, you're cheek to jowl with these people for weeks or months, you know, you better make the best of it. You know, it's a professional relationship. And, um, I don't have any problem working on music that doesn't push all my, you know, personal buttons. And in fact, most of the time that's the case. Um, it's great when it all lines up or even, uh, you know, portions of it line up, but it's sure. definitely, definitely not a necessity. Um, so much of what we've just been talking about is less about the sound of things and more about like the philosophy behind it. And, and, and you are tasked with the job of, of helping people create something that they find really, really important to them. So, um, it's, it's incumbent on you to figure that out. You know, um, I'm just glad to get paid to be honest. And that I was, that's how I felt in 1988. And that's how I feel now. I'm just glad I'm, I'm still shocked when anybody's like, Hey, I'll give you money to, to like do stuff like really <laughs> it's pretty great i love it so i mean i'm maybe i'm overly simplistic or maybe i'm just too easily uh satisfied but there's not a single record i've worked on that i've that i'm not proud of you know and and so much of that has to do with the you know the memories less of the music being made but of the you know conversations we had and the time we spent it's easy it's not as hard as, as it seems that's that's a great answer. I love that. That's uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use a variation of that because I, I get I get asked that question as well all the time. And I realize that when you're, I hate this phrase, but up and coming, when you or you live in a town with a limited amount of artists, so you're not always going to get the cream of the crop. Any of those situations, I get it. You're going to be faced with working with an artist that maybe is like, Ugh. but you're right. It's and I I have a similar answer, but I think yours is far more articulate than me. But yes, you make you you make it your own. I think is what I always say. You know, try and mm -hmm. bring the love of music that you have to it. And if you can help that artist walk out the door, like we've been talking about in so many of our answers, uh, you know, having they walk out the door knowing more about great music, having improved their game, learned some mm -hmm. new stuff. I mean, we've done some great things. Now, Mark mm -hmm. John Taus asked a question. Um, where he's asking about, um, you know, how many takes you should do. Do you do takes on vocals and then tune them and then come in, you know, do a comp and then uh, it's, I think it's probably, your, you know, how long is a piece of string? It depends. It's artist dependent. Do you, do you, do you <laughs> yeah. have a, do you have a methodology that you start with or do you just go with the flow? Um, I just go with the flow. It really, it, are we speaking specifically about vocals? Yeah. Vocals. Yeah. Um, well, like you mentioned before, a, a singer is a, in a unique situation as opposed to a guitar player, bassist, drummer, whatever, you know, um, they have, uh, they have a, a gift that nobody else in the band usually has. And oftentimes it's a gift that is, um, unpolished and specifically when it comes to technique. So a lot of the singers I've worked with over the years, they, they arrive with, uh, you know, a great voice and usually they're writing the lyrics as well. So they're carrying a lot of weight as maybe as a co-writer or maybe the songwriter, but they've got a voice that works and maybe they were just born with that and you know, the shape of their head and their sinuses and their lungs and their esophagus that all combines to make a cool thing that, um, most of the time they don't really have any idea about they haven't put the 10,000 hours into it. Let's just be honest. Like you're not, you're, you're not born playing guitar and you're not at six years old playing drums, you know, as, as good as you are when you're 20. And that's because you've sat down and you've learned to play that instrument. Most singers, rock singers have never learned how to play that instrument. They're born with it. So, uh, you know, where drummers will warm up and they'll, they'll hit their sticks before they play, or they might like, you know, warm their hands up. And guitar players get their fingers going and they make sure their instruments are tuned. Uh, they may have a bad head cold and be sick with, you know, with, with pneumonia, but they can still sit in the chair and play their guitar singer. That person's voice is so much more dependent on all of those external things. And they don't usually have the benefit of having spent any time really learning how to use their instrument, how to preserve it specifically. So a lot of the artists I work with, 
are shouters or people who are just really kind of just getting into singing or, or or all of those above and they're playing in a band that's really loud and they don't get a chance they got to kind of shout to get above it you don't get a lot of takes that's what i'm trying to say so like you know a band like um, casey this band from w- w- wales that i worked with um in 2017 uh, that guy just he screams nonstop. so Am I going to have him do like five complete takes on a five minute song on an album that we've got 14 days to track completely? No, (laughs) I'm going to make sure that he's going to do a little bit of a peak setting for his loudest stuff on whatever mic we've chosen. Make sure that, you know, he's not distorting the preamp, that it sounds right. And then we're going to go with whatever works for him. And specifically this singer, um, it worked best for him to sing the verse a couple of times, you know, or the first couple of phrases of the verse and then stop, roll back a little bit, punch into the next phrase and roll and kind of build a comp as you went. And, uh, because he didn't have a lot of takes in him and he's putting, I mean, God, in between these takes, he's heaving and like breathing, you know, heavy because it's a hard way to sing. And, but he's made other recordings and, and, uh, and he knows what's best for his vocal style. You're so, touching on something really huge. I just want to pause you for one second. Mm, okay, okay. And, and Long it, answer, sorry. No, it's a great answer. I want people that, who are, because a lot of people are asking questions about vocals, which is a very important part. Think about this, everybody, for a second. If you're doing 10 takes with a singer, you just did a live set. <laughs> yeah. Think about that. Yeah, yeah. People, people forget this. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, he didn't have much stamina. What do you mean? Well, we sung three songs. I'm like, and how many takes do you know, like 15, 20. So you, <laughs> just, so you just put your singer through 60 takes, full takes of the songs. Yeah. You're telling like me that's worth, not, yeah, Like well, a week's touring right yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I've, I've had that. I've had people tell me, you know, yeah. oh, yeah, they're good, but they not much stamina. You know, oh, distortion there. But I'm just like, really? You, yeah. you know, it's, it's so, something very yeah. important for us to think about. And also, like you know, we've all probably heard the stories about Frank Sinatra walking into Capitol Studios, sure. and he shows up. The mic's been tested with like a sound alike, you know, and the orchestra's good to go. And Nelson Riddle hits, you know, the baton, the downbeat, and Frank walks in, puts down his glass of scotch, and you know, takes his hat off. He sings that thing once, and then he's out the fucking door. Pardon my French. And you know, like that's what we'd all like to do. Sure. But but Frank didn't sing. 40, 50 times uh, in a night. And I don't think that he probably could. I don't know that any singer really ought to, um, with some notable exceptions. But uh, I, uh, to answer that question, I think it's super important to be mindful of, of what your singer is facing, what that person is actually being asked to do. And do not ask that person to do something that, uh, that they don't need to do. Let's not do endless takes for these people. You know, uh, it doesn't matter if they're screaming or if they're singing as quietly as possible. It doesn't really matter. Like, like let's not figure out the sound of the vocal at the end of the second take. Let's figure it out early on. You know, let's, you need to think, like you mentioned, you need to think harder and longer about your singers than you do in almost any, well, truly any other, any other member of, of the group. Um, cause they again have, limited amount of time and it may take them time to get to that place too. So they may have to sing it, you know, for 10, 20 minutes. And if they, and they may not know that they need to do that. So having hot water for tea available, making sure that, um, you know, there's honey and other things that can extend that or to loosen up those vocal cords. Or if they just have a way of singing that works best for them, then just go with that. Don't, don't try to get them suddenly, you know, the day of, tracking vocals into yep. a regimen that they're not used to because not everybody's voice actually reacts well to warm water and honey and, 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 uh, and lemon. So, uh, for instance, can I just uh, one analogy, a really quick one, please, um, please. It's great. Jeremy, Jeremy Enoch from Sunday Day real estate. So you see, I we, wanted to talk about that. I, I was, I yeah. was, I, I'm, Pause for one second. I was just okay. the the whole the whole time here. I'm like nobody's asked about uh, Sunny Day or the fire theft or anything like this. And I was like going, "That's what I want to talk about." <laughs> so I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to do. I'm going to ask a question, but off you go. So so Jeremy, <laughs> uh, when I saw Sunny Day, it was like maybe they don't play a handful of shows, and Sub Pop had signed them or was going to sign them, and Jeremy Enoch, the singer, um, had this beautiful voice, which he still has, mm-hmm. but he had a he had a high, clear falsetto 
that was choir boy like and uh, was just stunning to hear. Then some months later, they they toured their way from Seattle to Chicago, where I lived at the time, to record their album with me. And by the time they showed up, Jeremy was in a panic because I think because he was a teenager still, his voice had changed. He had uh, gone on their first tour ever, so he's singing night after night. And there, he also sings with a lot of volume and a lot of air and a lot of screaming too, but pitched screaming, which is maybe like the hardest thing on your vocals. And by the time he arrived, he, he his voice was shot and he was like talking like this, which is his, still his talking voice. He talks like this all the time. And he, but he was panicked. He, so he was a chain smoker. He'd stopped smoking in it right before he started the tour. Cause I want to be, have my voice in the best possible places possible. And all this touring is going to help. I'm going to really nail these vocal parts. And by the time he arrived, he had none of those things. He was like, his voice was cracking. He could hardly speak. And he was really distraught. And I'm like, okay, when was the last time I wasn't, wasn't like I'm some genius wizard that knew how to make him sing right again, but we're tracking the vocals or uh, everything but the vocals. We're getting to the point where it's time for him to sing. And, and I'm like, what was the, when was the last time your voice was doing what it was that when, when it was in a good place? Uh, you know, it was like two months ago. And what were you doing then? You know, were you smoking? Yes. I'm like, <laughs> okay, somebody let's get him a pack of cigarettes and go out and start smoking again. Like whatever you were doing before you started to fix things, Go back to that, you know, like long term, mm -hmm. we, we got to figure out a way for you to have a career because you can't tour and do what you're doing and have it work. And also you've hit, you know, puberty or something <laughs> like that. All these things are at play, but we have a record to finish. So let's go back to the last time. Uh, and, and yeah, he, he smoked a bunch of cigarettes cause he was, a, a, you know, he chain smoked back in those days and it did help. Because that was what his body had acclimated to. And that's, you know, like, I, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating smoking, but I'm just saying, you know, be mindful that, 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 you know, whatever routine is working for your singer, maintain it. If that singer is struggling before you get there, then help out. But there are ways to maintain a, vo a voice that, uh, that might get a little raw uh, after a couple takes. But uh, again, don't make your singers do stuff because you're not ready or you're not thinking about what it is that they got to do. Like, you know, and don't think that you've got to do a start to finish take. That's the only w real way to make a vocal sound great. You may have to do it in pieces. If this is a screamer, you know, Max Beam is from say anything, same thing. That guy had to sing on uh, 28 or 29 songs and he shouts his head off. If you've ever listened to any of that stuff, like he's constantly screaming, but he'd gone to a vocal coach by the time I got to work with him. And he learned how to get that same effect without all the volume, without rushing all that air past those taut, tightened vocal cords. So he could kind of do it kind of at will. And it was great. What a, what a pleasure that was to discover that, that this guy had finally taken the reins of his vocal career, you know, his instrument and learned how to maintain that. And everybody I'm talking about, including Jeremy Enoch has learned how to do that now. So Jeremy can sing anything, anytime. Well, he was, he's, he, he'll he'll, you he'll never have that. When he did ahead. Diary, he was, what, 19 or 20? He was young. He doesn't have uh, – the songs on Diary don't have the same vocal approach. I mean, we, we change things uh, because he no longer had that range, and he's, he's never going to have it again. He hasn't, you know, since he's been an adult. But he's deepened and extended this rich, lower – uh, almost baritone voice. I mean, he's just an amazing singer. He's an, and I'm glad that he took the challenge that he had and found his way through it. And, and that's the voice that we've been hearing now, you know, for decades. So, um, it, it is something that every, it's incumbent on every singer to, to figure that out. But as a producer and engineer, you're not always very rarely have I been the beneficiary of that. Usually they learn it in the process of making the record. And then if you get to work with them again, then they're like, oh, yeah, now I can sing the crap out of that stuff. No worries now. But like, you know, people blowing their voices out happened to me all the time when I was younger and I didn't know as much as I know now about how to help a singer get to where he or she needs to get. I mean, I'm a huge Sunny Day fan. I think if anybody watching doesn't know that album, Diary, go and get it. And also the Fire Theft actually is um, – I, th I had met you, were they, what year was it, 5th? 2003, 4? When was it? We finished it in 03. It came out 4 or 5, I think. Yeah. Maybe 2005, I think. No, we finished it in 2004, excuse me. Started in 2001, 
uh, we were supposed to start uh, the week of 9-11. And of course, we had to postpone. So it had an inauspicious beginning. And uh, I think it came out either 04 or 05. I, when that album... See, I, I'd met you in 2002. Do you remember when? No. <laughs> <laughs> when? What was it? You were doing the Bangles album. Oh, no way. Yeah, in right. a house, in a rented house, I believe. In, in Beverly Hills. In Beverly yeah. Hills, yeah. 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 I met you there. And I would was, was it the was it the open house we had? No, I I I'd, I'd recorded all the demos. I'd done the demos on ADATs. Uh, wait a second, how come I didn't know that? Wait. <laughs> I'm so sorry for forgetting that. I know, but I was I was focused. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine. And so that was right that was right wow. at the beginning, yeah. My wife said yeah. was streaming live. All right, she's yeah. She bring bring in a sandwich? What's she doing? <laughs> Hey, hi. I mean, it was Brad. Hi, nice Brad, to see you. Sasha, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm just checking in. Are you, it's been a long street, time. We've been at it for a while. Oh, okay. Where are you? Uh, Studio City. He's literally oh, down the street. Go down the hill. Neighbor. He's very Yeah, close. right right by Gelson's, you know. Oh, it's a 5 minute there drive. Go. I'll let you yeah. get back to it. So. All right, yeah. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Hopefully right. in person soon. Yeah, let's uh, let's get through this and then we'll we'll hang out. <laughs> All right, bye bye. The um, so what we say? Yeah, uh, Jer- Jeremy's so talented, but yeah. So I'd met you then. It's fine. Don't worry yeah. about it. I I I had I'd done all the de- demos in, in my studio on ADATS. Um, wow. So yeah, it was back in the day of the ADATS, and I remember you. I think you had just moved out from Chicago, wasn't it? Like two thousand. Was when we yeah, you up. just moved out, and yeah. I remember they were in a house. You'd rented this house, and you'd like racks, yep. racks of eight, eight, eight. So I remember that it was all like the, all of all, all of his Pro Tools stuff, and yep, it, it was back in those days when you know you were just like roll up with your own rig because you not yep. every uh, not every studio had Pro Tools, so you'd put your uh, own rig I, in. Yeah, I had a completely mobile studio from 1998, so um, everything was in racks, everything flight cased, and. Uh, and we rented this house because it was kind of equidistant to where all the all the women in the band lived, and um, uh, and I went to the hardware store and bought a bunch of uh, drywall and and two by fours, and we rented this house month to month. It was a teardown, but they were waiting for the permits to build whatever they were going to build, and uh, ah. we took the we took the master bedroom, um, and I just framed out um, soffits, you know, like th- that would go over that went over the um, uh, there were two sets of sliding glass doors and there were a couple of windows and I just, you know, just plugged those up with, uh, you know, with, with drywalled, uh, wooden framed plugs that went over it. And, um, and we set up and it took us months to record it. Uh, but it was a ball. It was really fun. Yeah. They're really, very, they're very really easy to work with. And then we mixed it at Conway cause I didn't have my studio here yet. But essentially that setup was what I just basically moved into here. I was, I was already using this setup with this desk and everything going back to 1998. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm. Yeah. So I remember, so I met you then and then yeah. it was a couple of years later and then I, I got the fire theft record and whenever it came out and mm. I just, I love that record for those people that don't know the record, go and listen to it. The drum sounds are so good on that. Thanks. I love the, I, William, man, we, and now that was happening at the same time as the Bangles record. So I would do, Oh. A month with the I do a month with the Bengals and then I would take a week fly up to Seattle uh, to Williams family's house in Kirkland, Washington, and uh, track drums in his basement, uh, seven foot ceilings with some of the some of the basement didn't even have flo- it was mud it was dirt floor <laughs> it was built in the eighteen hundreds, and I slept in that basement as well so I would sleep in the room that I was tracking in, um, uh, and then I come back and work on bangles. And then there was a period where Jeremy and William were here, um, in Los Angeles to work on lyrics with me and cut vocals in this room, but working on a laptop because my rig was in Beverly Hills working in the house that we rented for the bangles. So I'd finish a bangle session, like at 10 o'clock at night, come back here for the night owl session with William and Jeremy in my backyard. And, um, and a lot of times it was just working on lyrics it's mostly just jeremy and i wills along for you know emotional support but um i see i love sunny day and 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 diary is my favorite album of theirs um because i just think it 
you know, it's everybody says this, um, you know, because it's sort of the roadmap for what emo was going to become after that. It's, mm. it's definitely mm-hmm. like a roadmap mm-hmm. record. Um, you know, Exile and Guyville is, in, in Guyville is like, a, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it. What's what's the common what's it's sort of like the first kind of female empowerment album of the 90s that really meant something and you know I, I think without that there wouldn't have been an Alanis and all this kind of stuff I think mm, we all recognize maybe. these things but Fire mm-hmm. Theft for me was kind of like hitting all of the things that I love because it's, it's it's definitely like a modern record that you know I mean Jeremy would have been a whopping 25 or something you know or, <laughs> you know what I mean a veteran yeah. of the Seattle music scene maybe 26 27 but the point it is was- Stupid. Close to thirty, I think. Yeah, young, still. Yeah, young. still young. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's only forty-five now, and if you're doing it in two thousand three, yeah, he'd been twenty-seven. Crazy. Twenty-seven. Wow. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah so twenty-seven years old making this record, but they were veterans of the Seattle scene, and half mm. the band had obviously gone off and joined the Foo Fighters, famously, and we all know, we all know those stories. But the thing about the Fire Theft record is it keeps all of that legacy of the Seattle thing, but it's also just like a really freaking great, straight, straight ahead is the wrong word, but a really great rock record. Like I just put Thanks. it on and I just get to en- I enjoy that album. You know, it's, yep. it's some. Do you know, we're, do you know, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you because I got to say, you know, what we were referencing over and over again to get, circle back to this, this topic about referencing things. Yep. We were listening to Genesis. Phil Collins and Led Zeppelin for that whole record. It sounds I like mean, it. <laughs> oh, and, and Pete Townsend, Pete Townsend, yeah. uh, Empty Glass. Like um, Bill Price, and, Bill Price comes up again. Yeah. He's the engineer <laughs> and the mixer on that album. Wow. So yeah. that, I mean, but really <laughs> so much like, uh, like waste time, you know, don't want to waste time. That's straight up, you know, Peter Gabriel era, era, uh, Genesis, um, and 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 always the Who. God, I mean, we're, uh, we're Jeremy had never really listened to the Who when uh, they worked with me, um, and I was like, man, you know, the first punk rock band was the Who. Listened, you know, their very first singles, "My Generation." He's stuttering and he's singing about like, you know, societal alienation and not, you know, like like a whole group of young people being put down and and. And uh, and they're like, oh my God, you're right. Like, and I'm like, yeah, you know, the Clash opened for the Who in '79 and '80, and like, it it made sense that you know they were like, they and the Stooges were, and and the MC5 were, you know, proto punk. They were they they yeah. pre yeah. they they pre- they predicted punk rock, and blue chair. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, to to an extent, yeah, blue chair. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. pink pink fairies. I think bands like so, pink fairies in England and and blue chair over here were like. They were like mm-hmm. psychedelic rock bands that maybe their amateurism is what made them so, you know, proto punk as you put it. You right, know? right, right. Yeah. But uh, but, but uh, with, with Jeremy, by the time we made the Fire Theft record, he was really listening to a lot of Pete Townsend, a lot of the Who, and 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 I was pushing the Genesis prog rock stuff because oh. that was where you know, and and we just you know, I'm not a huge fan of that stuff, but when it works, it's undeniably great. Right. So there's just so many classic rock moments in that. And I think that's why people tend to, you know, like, like I'll put that album on. I'll listen to the whole album. You know, like, we, you know, we spent a lot of time, again, thinking about about the experience. You know, you put your headphones on and you put, you know, you put this album on and it's supposed to carry you all the way through. Um I love that record un- unambiguously. That's just like such a great record. And William, I love his record. I mean, we, we dialed in those drum sounds, um, and he was—he just had a lot to prove, you know, because he had his post the Foo Fighters experience, and and he really wanted to make uh, this record count, you know, uh, as as a drummer. And he relearned how to play. He had some some physical uh, issues with like hitting too hard and some. Um, carpal tunnel issues. I think he had carp- has carpal tunnel or did in both wrists. So he was trying to learn how to with with a really great drum teacher. Try to how, there we go. That ten thousand hours again. Here's a guy who was a great drummer, probably just started playing, and now he was learning how to how to play more efficiently and and pulling from references that weren't like from the punk rock era that were inspiring him at the time. So he's listening to jazz guys and he's listening to more more classic rock guys, and he wants to be 
like the best possible drummer ever. And partly also because he was in a band with one of the best rock drummers ever. And, and it didn't go so well at that time. And he had a lot to prove. And I think that this record does that exactly. So like we had a couple competing interests and they all combined in the end to make a great record. I think, you know? I mean, I, I'd pay to have him go back in and make another record like that. Oh my God, please. Yeah. I would love it. I would love it. I would record those guys in the drop of a hat. I mean, you don't have to ask me twice. You don't even have to ask me. I'm just like, I'm, I wake up every morning thinking, am I going to record some version of Sunny Day or Fire Theft again? Like yeah. I would love it. I would yeah. love it. I, I don't know what it'll take. William's got a new band called Assertions. A S S E R T I O N S. And I think they were supposed to be on a little West coast tour, which is now I think postponed, but they've been in, a recording and he sent me some stuff and it sounds fantastic. It's so obviously William, you know, it, nobody plays like, like William does, man. Amazing. What a great, great uh, drummer. So a couple of people here picking up, uh, Ingr yep. Ingrid says, so awesome that someone is talking about the far theft all in capital letters. It's over is one of my favorite songs. <laughs> uh, Everyone listen to it. And then, and then they asked, did Nate Mendel play on that album? He sure did. <laughs> Okay. Are you are you kidding? He just showed up one night. Uh, we were in the Williams family house, like you know, like the old house like, that they all, you know, grandma and grandpa lived in and stuff. And Will was there with his girlfriend at the time, living there, and Jeremy was living there. And I'm down in the basement, and we're rehearsing. And I'd come upstairs to get, you know, go to the bathroom or something. And there's like a knock at the door, and I go to the door. It's like ten o'clock at night, and I open it up, and it's Nate. <laughs> He's like. Hey man, <laughs> how you doing? I'm like, oh my God, I haven't seen you in years. And he just, he had heard from a friend of a friend, you know, everybody is trying to always get those guys back together again. So I can't imagine like if he's hanging out in Seattle for more than like a day, somebody's going to like get word like, Hey, you know, Nate's in town. Will and, and Jeremy need to get together because everyone wants the, you know, sunny day to <laughs> always reform. Always. It's, yeah. it's like, yeah. you know, so yeah, he just wandered by. Um, and, uh, and they're like, oh, hey, man, you know, and like they hung out for a while. And I quietly went and took my bass and put it back in his case because <laughs> I was supposed to be the bass player on that stuff. And it was really obvious that, yeah, I am not going to be playing bass on this project. I was happy to relinquish my like two day long stint as the bass player for the fire theft. <laughs> but then he next day he showed up with his basses and, and off to the races. Nobody plays bass like him, man. Like. Ah, he was uh, the bass parts on that record. Um, everything, those are some of my all time favorite musicians and they're all doing, you know, except for Dan, who wasn't, you know, a part of that project, uh, who's also, you know, he brings his own amazing guitar playing and his vocal style to fire Th or to sunny day. But like, man, it was so great to hear these guys playing together again. It was really great. Really, really great. Well, I hope, I hope they do something again soon. I hope you get to do it. And and maybe oh. I can come down and assist for a couple of days or something. Oh yeah, come on, you know, we'll pull out the ADATs. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days. Those were the days. Woo. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. A, a good couple of hours of your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks everybody for joining us here. Please leave a whole bunch of comments and questions below the video. Once this goes off, just come and comment. If we didn't touch on the questions, please feel free to ask, and maybe I'll throw Brad under the bus, and he can. Go in oh, and yeah, see, sure. see some questions. So keep keep with, with the good questions. Um, it's it's been wonderful. Please hit that like. What, what is it again? Smash the smash like. Smash it. Smash, smash that like button. Yeah. Smash that like button. See, Brad. Brad asked you to do it, not me. <laughs> and Warren, can I, I want to interrupt you for a second. I please, want to please, thank please. you. I want to thank you for for what you do with with the program and like uh, you're consistent. You're hard at work at it, and you're imparting a lot of useful information and knowledge and some wisdom and, uh, and most importantly to me, uh, a great attitude about the, you know, about, about the craft of making records. You've got a really good attitude about it and, and that's really appreciated. Thanks. That's so kind of you. I re I really appreciate it. I think we are blessed, uh, guys like us that we grew up at a time sort of the generation X time. It's so lucky. So we're surrounded by it. So we got, we got to look back. Um, like neither of us probably remember Led Zeppelin except for maybe in through the outdoor coda period. Mm -hmm. But we mm -hmm. got to look back at that. We got to look back at the 60s. But then we're right slap bang in the middle, late 70s through 80s, when all of these insane bands just like brought in all this different stuff. And we are so blessed. Mm -hmm. It's like a great connect connection that w we have. 
Um, yep. You know, ability to be able to connect all these different styles and and love of artistic freedom and great songwriting and musicianship and that they, we. I know you're the same as me. We believe it can all exist together. There's no right way or wrong way. So I appreciate mm -hmm. what you're saying, but I think it's born out of it's born out of just a genuine love for music and the, and making music and of course recording music. We're yeah. very lucky. Thank you. you you've been so amazing. And well, you thanks and I, so much for having me. You and I could talk for hours because we have so many of the same musical tastes. I think so. Yeah. Amazing. And the fire theft, everybody. I know it's a place to end on. Check out, <laughs> check out the new single um, um, from, um, uh, can you play it again? Oh, Liz. Yeah. Liz Fair's yeah. new single. Yeah, check it, it's yeah, cool. Well, it, I was trying to remember the name. Good. Well, Good Side is the single. Good the album is called, it. yeah, the album's called Soberish and we just Sober -ish. finished it. So Soberish. <laughs> It's uh, <laughs> it, it'll be out sometime. I mean, everything is a, a little bit of flux because of the pandemic. Sure. But uh, I think the plan is for it to come out late spring or summer. You know, don't hold me to that. But uh, it's God, it's a great record. I'm so proud of it. And um, yeah, that's a great album. Boy, <laughs> I can't wait for people to hear it. So we'll all be sitting around. Maybe we'll all be sitting around by ourselves with our headphones on, but nothing better than to listen to the new Liz Fair record. <laughs> One of one of the upsides is is I, I'm I'm doing more listening to music for pleasure. For sure, me too. Me too. It's really weird. I I I thought that maybe I was because I don't really get to watch Netflix that much, and sometimes I've got a couple of screens. Sometimes I'll put something on in the background while I'm writing yeah. emails to my brain, and and that's now all being replaced by only music. I have this playlist I've created, and I'm mm -hmm. calling it Everything. It's my Everything playlist. And it's, yeah. it's, it's sort of pretty much mirrors what you and I talked about. Like, it's like, it starts with some, starts with King Crimson, goes into Queen mm -hmm. Kate Bush, Genesis, The Cure, Joy Division, it's Bowie, yeah. Killing Joke, Hatfield in the North, for anybody who really wants to know their 70s. Wow. Punk, <laughs> Roxy Music, more Joy Division, yeah. Depeche Mode, yeah. more Kate Bush. share that. Yeah. Are you going to share that playlist? You gotta yeah, do that. Eno. But then I got Steely Dan, yeah. then back to Bowie, then look back to the Cure, the for a Forest. It's just like, yeah. to me, it's like, I get, I'm like, wow, this is like this eclectic love of just, ah, yeah. Great. Anyway, mm. you're amazing. Thank you for all of your time. Okay. Please hit the smash the like button, as Brad <laughs> would say. And I will share the playlist. Uh, um, I keep adding to it, though. Um, and Chris says, what? Listening to music for pleasure? <laughs> Unheard of. Unheard of. Yeah. Unheard of. <laughs> All Thank right, you. guys. Thank you so much. Thanks ever so much. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.